Good morning to everyone and welcome back for those who are coming back and welcome to all of those who have just arrived. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you. I'm the Executive Director of Victims Sports Europe. My name is Levent uh, and I'll be hosting uh, the second day of the conference. So uh, I'm really happy. We had an excellent meeting yesterday. Uh, we had lots of interaction, lots of interesting speakers and we're moving on and continuing uh, our theme, which is focused on transforming victim support uh, from dream to reality. So. Today's programme continues the concept that we talked about. Um, we have been very focused on trying to understand what it takes to establish victim support uh, in a country um, and changing the concept of, of victim support being delivered by a single organisation to really now having a, a national uh, framework for victim support where we understand that support is the job of everyone and that there are many different sectors involved in delivering support. We heard yesterday about how we need independent oversight and evaluation, that we need uh, standards for organisations. We heard about the history of developing victim support both in Europe and in Asia. So today what we're going to be seeing and hearing about is how we develop more specialised services, but also the different sectors which are involved in, in delivering their own forms of victim support. Uh, and why is this important? It's really uh, about changing the concepts and understanding of who is responsible, how we work together. And you can see there, this is the, the, the National Victim Support Framework, which we showed you. You see that circle, there are many different sectors uh, which can be and should be involved in helping victims in different ways. So today what we're going to hear about is uh, uh, from different uh, individuals who have actually been doing this in practice, um, whether in the academic world, whether in the health sector, police sector, uh, in the judicial sector, and how precisely they've done that. And we can give, give a perfect uh, example of that, to be honest. Um, we are on to thank Elastic, which is uh, an organization that, that, that we work with, that's partnered with us and has, has offered um, to sort out all of the technical aspects of this. And we also work with C-Graphica uh, and they have done a lot of pro bono work for us as well. And it's the understanding of how private sector and victim support work organizations can work together to deliver for victims. There's a lot of potential there. The idea of today's conference is really to show you that potential, show you how it's worked. And we hope you'll go away uh, and, and make the most of these, this new knowledge and these new connections as well. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, someone I've known for quite a while, who has really been transforming uh, the way that victim support is, is provided in Finland. Lena Kaiser Arberg um, has been the Executive Director of Victim Support Finland since March 2014. And before leading Victim Support Finland, she worked in a, a variety of Finnish NGOs, such as the Finnish Red Cross, where she spent 12, which, in which she spent 12 years. And she has extensive experience in international cooperation, having been a member of several Nordic and European networks. And Lena Kaiser is going to speak about the specialization of services within her organization. So Lena Kaiser, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. I hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, it's Sherry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Liv, and, and dear participants and dear VSE friends. Um, thanks for this opportunity to speak at this conference. Many times in our discussions uh, at VSC, we have wondered why general or generic victim services are sometimes considered to be so general that uh, they would not be able to provide specialized services to victims of crime. So what do these terms actually mean? General, generic, specialist, specialized. I will try to open in this presentation how we see in, in RICU, Victim Support Finland, the contents of generic services and why we think it's extremely important to work from a needs-based approach and not to stare at the definition of either general or specialist. In practice, it can be difficult to make this distinction. And it does not help that the two crucial international instruments concerning victims' rights, support and protection, the EU Victims Directive and the Istanbul Convention defined general and specialist support in a different way. So this can sometimes cause confusing if we are to stare at the concepts very precisely. 
But first, before going more deeper into the theme, I will say a few words of Victim Support Finland, Riku, uh, and our Finnish name is, is Riko Suhri Päivistys, and that's why we shorten it to Riku. Bianca yesterday said that Weisering from Germany is the old aunt. So I thought maybe, maybe Riku is at the early mid middle ages, at the time where life uh, gets hopefully a little bit more stable after some very hectic years, I must say. So our services are for all crime victims and we produce the general victim services in Finland according to the Victims' Rights Directive. The government has given us a public obligation for producing these services based on a 10-year agreement with the Ministry of Justice. The ministry also provides the funding for these services and, and for this year it's uh, approximately 4.6 million euros. We cover the whole of Finland, which is quite a wide country, with 31 local service points managed by our seven region, regional offices. Some of the local offices are situated in very scarcely populated remote areas, such as in the north of Lapland or on the Swedish-speaking autonomous Åland Islands in the Baltic Sea. Thus, the service points work in very different circumstances depending on the population density and other factors of the surrounding environment. Our services consist of, of face-to-face -face service, meaning, uh, for example, accompanying the victim to a police station or a court hearing, as well as telephone helplines, an online chat service. And we also meet victims at places where they are, such as shelters or police stations. Um, here you can see the, how the number of clients has grown significantly in recent years. Uh, I will soon show a, a, a diagram of a little bit longer period. Um, the increase like from 2019 to, to 2020 was, was 25% when we count all the clients in the different services. Uh, almost 80% of the clients are women. The total number of clients has actually grown four times bigger since uh, from 2015 uh, to 2020. Uh, and 2016 is the year when the Victims Directive was implemented in Finland, both into legislation and into practice. So at the same time, the funding for RICU for us was clearly raised. And, and here you can see the results. Most of our clients are victims of violence crimes, but during recent years, the number of clients in other types crime types has been growing. For example, the proportion of cybercrime victims grows every year. It's of course a very good thing that we are able to reach out to more and more victims of different crimes. In this table, you can see the main crime, type, crime types in our services, uh, but even in, in long-term support relations, the proportion of violence crimes is even bigger. It's, it's, it's almost 70%. Um, the wide variety of different crime types, types in our services means that our staff and volunteers really need a wide scale of knowledge about different, victim, different crimes and victims' special need for support depending on the crime type. For example, the advice the victim needs in cybercrime can be technically very specific. Thus, RICO has an ongoing training system so that we're able to respond to the varying needs of our clients. So my argument here is that generic is actually very specialized. If we look at Article 9 of the Victims Directive, we see that the requirements for a general victim service are really quite demanding. Just to be able to support a person in the crime process, taking into consideration the individual needs of the victim, requires a huge amount of information and understanding of how the criminal system works, both in legislation and in practice. Providing emotional support for a victim who has gone through possibly a very traumatic experience is definitely something that requires special training and skills. Thus, a generic service requires specialized structures and skills. We implement types of supports that are not available in any other victim services, such as providing trained support persons to accompany the victim to a court hearing. Our support persons can help the victim to make an application for a restraining order or for crime compensations. We, of course, take into consideration gender issues. Working with women who are victims of gender-based violence constitutes a large part of our work. Currently, we are working on how to better reach out to victims 
of different minorities, a really important aim. An essential sector of our work is volunteer management. It's quite clear that it would not be possible to support such numbers of victims without the help of volunteers. And as we know, volunteers guarantee a very special human touch in the service. Volunteer management is an area of expertise of its own and constitutes really a large part of our everyday work. I find that one great definition for generic services is, is that uh, Generic means that we don't turn any victim away. The service is open to everyone and equality is a starting point. All this does not in any way, any way undermine the need for services that are specialized for certain victim groups. Quite the opposite. There is certainly also a need for services that can, for example, reach out to specific victim groups or provide the kind of service that is not part of the service coverage of a general victim service. This could include, for example, psychological support, trauma therapy, physical safety, such as shelters and peer support. There is indeed room for all kinds of support that victims need. They should have the right to choose and be well informed of the different options. However, sometimes it is challenging to know what is the right service for each and every one. And here we really need well-functioning referral mechanisms. Also for the police, the system and role of different services should be made as clear as possible. The need of the victim should be the starting point for a service. I think that's quite evident. All forms of request services start with the needs assessment. Sometimes the client only wants information of a specific in single question. Sometimes the need is for long-term face-to-face support, which can last for several years, the whole criminal process. We have tried to adapt the service so that there is a channel for everyone. For example, young people often do not want to talk. Speaking on the telephone can be too much. For these clients, the online chat service can be an easy way to take contact. Our Riku chat was originally developed for young people, but then widened uh, for all clients. But still today, many young victims take their first contact through the chat, and some of them have been victims of very serious crimes. If the needs are something that Riku we cannot provide, then we will, of course, refer the client to a service that fits the needs in a better way. We keep statistics all the time of all referrals, both to us and from us. In RICO, we refer thousands of clients to other services every year. What about combining a general service and a specialist service that is tailored for a specific group of victims? Since 2015, RICO has been implementing a specialist service for victims of human trafficking. In this service, we meet victims of different kinds of trafficking. Most of them are victims of labor exploitation, but a large part have a background in sexual exploitation. Currently, we have three staff members, experts working in this, this uh, special service and 30 volunteers specially trained for these victims. The number of clients in this uh, special service has grown significantly since it started. One major change, change has been that today RICO is one of the top agencies in Finland that identify victims of human trafficking. Last year we were the number one agency in referrals to the official governmental service system for victims of human trafficking. We actually identified more trafficking victims than the police. Lina, you have five minutes left. Thank you. The results in combining the general general uh, service with a specialist service have been encouraging. There is an added value when a victim service, a victim specific service, covers the whole country, utilizing the structures of the basic general service. Currently, the credibility is high among the victims. Working relations with other stakeholders are good, and advocacy for the rights of trafficking victims is strong. With the police, new cooperation methods have been developed. For example, the police can come to our office to meet the client who wants to be anonymous at this stage. This is one way of building trust between the fearful victim and the police. The decision on how to move forward is always the client's. In our context, the possibility to try different working methods is more free in a specialist service, which is really valuable also for the basic service. With the possibility to spread information and knowledge of such a difficult and complex phenomena as human trafficking, 
we have also made the whole of RICU more aware of this issue with training and guidelines. As a result, more and more trafficking victims are being identified in our general services. So the staff and volunteers are trained and guided in identifying features in the client situation, which could indicate a possibility of trafficking. For example, if you have in the basic service a migrant woman victim of domestic violence, could there also be features of human trafficking when she tells that her husband has forced her to smuggle drugs? Or if a client tells that he hasn't been paid his salary as agreed, and when talking about the situation, there comes up features of control that extend also to life's life outside work. So identifying features of human trafficking is really not easy. It requires a very sensitive approach and knowledge about the, the many different ways in which exploitation of a vulnerable, vulnerable person can appear. So in these situations, uh, in RICU, our three experts in trafficking issues can support the personnel in the basic service uh, in this situation when they are uh, identifying, possibly identifying victims of human trafficking. In RICO, we see that see many win-wins in combining general, generic and specialist services. Probably the most important thing is that for victims, this can mean better equality for reaching and receiving the service in all areas of a very wide country. However, our aim in victim support Finland, I want to make clear is not to grow the number of specialist services unless we really need see that there is a clear need, need for it and, and there is no other support service uh, better suitable for the job. We want to keep the service agile and flexible. The need of the victim should always be in the main principle for our work. We will continue to work for well-functioning equal services for all victims in our country. This includes good cooperation with all the different services and with the authorities, as well as strong advocacy work. As we have seen in recent years in Finland in our country, the numbers of clients have grown in all victim services, whether general or, or specialist. So unmet hidden needs seem to be better fulfilled now than before. Thank you. Thank you, Lena Kaiser. I think you've raised, well, I know you've raised a lot of important uh, points there. The, these issues uh, continuously come up. Um, I think, um, as you pointed out, this is all driven by the needs of victims. Um, and it's important that, that this is understood to be filling gaps um, and to be um, about access, about choice, about simplicity and minimizing secondary victimization. And, and the way that, that uh, Riku has been focusing on certain areas, but making sure it's able to cover all, all the, the different requirements of different groups is, is what make, makes it uh, such an important type of service. I think especially as you're a national organization and it's very difficult with specialized services to be, have a national coverage, working with them, but also being able to specialize yourself really helps that, that, that coverage. So thanks. So thank you for starting to touch on the, these issues, which we know is a long standing, standing question. So let, let's move on now. We, we've heard about the specialization uh, within a generic victim support services for all victims. Uh, but another extremely important area is, is the academic world. Um, I have been working with Suzanne van der Aar, our, our next uh, speaker for many years now. Um, I think uh, we have learned together the importance of, of, of that uh, combination of uh, academic research and frontline uh, input. Um, we, we're always finding new ways to work together, most recently with the Council of Europe um, review of its, its existing legal uh, instruments, uh, where, where Suzanne, because of her expertise, brought in both, both academics and civil society to be part of that process. So Suzanne van der Aar works as a full professor of criminal law and criminal procedure within the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology of Maastricht University. And her research focuses on victims of crime and victims' rights within the context of criminal proceedings. She's led various national and international research projects involving victims of road traffic offences, victims of intimate partner violence, protection orders, qualified, vict qualified victims and property crimes within marriage. So we're going to hear a little bit from Suzanne about the, the way that academia really delivers uh, for victims. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Lev, and uh, the entire VSE organization for having me. I'm going to try to share my screen with you. 
let's see. Um, no. Start. How do I get this um, DF? You click on the slideshow at the top. Normally that would work. One yeah, but I can't find it. Slightly up. Up. There, that one. All right. Oh, I didn't know that one. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks for having me. I'm really uh, glad for the opportunity to uh, talk about the importance of the connection between academia and, and victim support in particular. And uh, the organization asked me, well, first of all, to relate about my personal experiences with this um, very important connection. But they were first and foremost interested in the answer to the following question. Uh, how can the academic world have a much bigger impact on victims' issues? Well, I was, I was glad that they phrased this as such. Um, at least this sentence uh, implies that academia does have an impact on victims' issues, and I agree. But it also uh, implies that we're not living up to our full potential. And I agree with that as well. Uh, so we can do much more, but how then? And I would like to add to this question also the reverse. So how can victims' issues or victim support in particular, well, uh, help have a much bigger impact on academia in return? Because I think um, it goes both ways. It truly is a cross-fertilization that's going on. Um, First of all, academia profits or benefits from uh, victim support in various ways. Um, it's obvious, of course, uh, in my line of business doing research, uh, sometimes it's victim support organizations who have assignments for academics because they want to find out um, what approach works best for victims or they want to have their procedures evaluated. Um, this doesn't happen too often. Uh, typically, you know, victim support organizations do not have very deep pockets and they cannot afford academic research. So it's typically other people who give out assignments, uh, governments, um, etc. cetera. Um, and then victim support is crucial in terms of data collection. Um, I think in my own line of research, um, approximately 60% of my studies could not have been conducted without the help of victim support. You know, without them, I could never have had access to victims for victim surveys or interviews, or I could not have uh, interviewed people working for victim support organizations. So to me, they are in uh, yeah, very valuable. And uh, so thank you very much for this. Um, a second way in which academia benefits from victim support is when it comes to policy advice. Sometimes academics are asked to, um, well, to think about policy uh, legislation. And um, I find uh, my contacts with victim support very valuable, you know, as sparing partners. Like Lev said, you know, you need that frontline vision as well, because I know a thing or two about research, but I know very little about practice. And to me, that's invaluable. And I know some of my colleagues think otherwise. Some of them are a bit hesitant to have too much involvement with victim support. Uh, you know, they fear that their objectivity is on the line there. Well, I agree to disagree there. I think you can be perfectly objective and, uh, you know, maintain your academic rigor while at the same time having all relevant partners and sectors involved in these discussions. The final way in which academia benefits from victim support is through education. Admittedly, this is just a small part. Uh, this truly is underdeveloped. Um, in, in my education uh, at a law faculty, I sometimes invite uh, people working for victim support organizations over to give a guest lecture, um, victims even, but this happens very rarely. And that to me is still rather strange. In law education, legal education, we find it very natural to have ex-prisoners or uh, judges, public prosecutors give guest lectures. But you know, the other way around is far less self-evident. It doesn't happen very often or at all. Then what's the other side of the coin? How does 
victim support uh, benefit from academia and from academic research. Obviously, when victim support wants to find something out, um, they can, uh, well, give assignments to academia and then profit from the results directly in practice. But what is often overlooked is that even, um, you know, participation in research can be beneficial to clients, to victims. Um, I know that ethical review boards, they mainly focus on the risks involved in participation in academic research. And rightfully so, because there are risks that we have to take into account. But studies have also shown that for some victims, and, and perhaps even many victims, it can be very rewarding to participate in uh, scientific um, studies. And I've experienced that myself. Uh, you know, very often it happens that once you have conducted an interview, that the victims express their gratitude for being allowed to, to contribute. So instead of just receiving help, instead of just being the recipients, they can also, um, well, they get a sense of sense making, you know, they can help others in return. And a final way, uh, possibly there are more ways in which uh, victim support profits from academia. I only mentioned three, uh, but an important one is also, um, you know, the situations where we can join forces when it comes to lobby work and, and policy making. Um, in my experience, uh, lobby efforts from victim support organizations can be immensely strengthened when their argumentation is substantiated by academic research. So when we manage to act in tandem, victim support, academia, preferably other sectors as well, you know, we are a strong force to reckon with and we can be much more impactful. So already we are cooperating and we are making significant progress, but of course there's always room for improvement. And that's also what the question from VSE suggested. Now talking um, from my own background, um, I noticed several points for improvement, uh, but I'm also curious to learn from uh, all the other participants in this conference about their experiences. Uh, Lev just mentioned the Council of Europe recommendation. I was indeed invited to make a draft recommendation, uh, a new draft recommendation on victims' rights. And what immediately struck my attention was that the assignment was only given to me without further instructions, nothing of the sort. Not even, you know, a suggestion that I should consult at least victim support, perhaps the police, well, you name it. So, and I noticed this on several occasions that when it comes to policy making and, and advice, not all sectors that are relevant are structurally involved in these policy cycles. And I think there's room for, for improvement there. Now, I try to make it my business to get everyone on board, and, um, but it was really up to my discretion and it shouldn't be like that. In terms of vision on victims' research and policy, uh, what you see quite often is that there is no real vision or it's only a short term or at best an intermediate term vision on these issues. And that results in an abundance of one-off studies uh, on very topical issues, you know, that are heavily debated at that time. Um, no longitudinal studies. Uh, typically, we work under a lot of time pressure. Um, you, you can be glad if, you know, you are allowed a year to do your studies. And, and for academic research, it can be too short. I also noticed that I uh, typically work with the usual partners in crime. And of course, you know, that has to do with the limitations of my own network. But it also has to do with the fact that many academics do not identify themselves as being relevant for the field of victimology, even though they are. But because they self-identify as psychologists, econom ec economists, um, criminal lawyers, they are not on board, even though they could have highly important information. And I also typically work with the same partners in crime, uh, 
when I reach out to victim support organizations in different countries, for instance, it's typically the same organization who are always willing and able to cooperate. Whereas some countries and organizations are notoriously difficult to reach out to. And that results in, well, geographical blind spots, for instance, when we want to know about the legal system of the country. In academia, there is a staggering lack of compulsory or even elective courses on victims and victims' rights. Um, there are no programs or perhaps one program in Ireland um, you know, that, that revolves around this issue. Uh, we could do much more in that regard. The publication culture in academia is still, um, well, geared towards top A journals. Whereas I think, especially in the field of victimology, we need to uh, focus on open access publications. We need to make sure that victim support is also able to access these publications that could be relevant for their line of business as well. And difficulties in data collection. Um, whenever I work together with victim support organizations, um, I noticed that registration systems, of course, are not geared towards academic research. Um, and I find that very natural, but maybe by tinkering a little bit, you know, it could improve and it could make our lives much easier. And that brings me to the following slide. So how could we perhaps transform our cooperation in order to address the issues on the previous slide. I think we could greatly benefit from um, developing truly interdisciplinary, structural, national and international networks with a longer term vision on victim research, policy, support, et cetera, et cetera. And ideally, these networks would not only involve academia and uh, victim support, but also other sectors, the police, uh, other actors working within the criminal justice system, um, health systems. And this would enable us to create a vision on the much longer term, say 10 years, you know, looking at a 10 years perspective, what should victim victimological research focus on then? It would allow us to set up more longitudinal studies and to identify blank spots in our total body of knowledge. Also, we need to somehow make sure that important relevant sectors are more structurally involved in, in policy cycles. Open access publication, I think, um, speaks for itself. Um, somehow we need to make sure that in law, perhaps also in, in medicine, uh, in so certain relevant programs, at least one course needs to be dedicated to victims and victims issues. And uh, pivotal is also the openness to critical reflection and critical self-reflection. Uh, sometimes an academic study um, can lead to the conclusion that something could be changed for the better, also when it comes to, uh, to victim support work. Um, you know, if we're not open to those suggestions, um, there's no need for conducting uh, research to begin with, perhaps. So, you know, um, openness to critical self-reflection. That also has, uh, it means that academics, uh, they have to be able to be critical, uh, but you shouldn't burn somebody down. So give practice something to work with. Now, I, uh, I know there are various very good initiatives going on, um, starting with uh, the national support frameworks that uh, VSE is working on, um, the EU, um, uh, uh, come on, the, the um, what, I forgot it. Well, the cost action cost programs action. are excellent examples of, of creating these networks. Um, the EU victims' rights strategy makes mention of, of how important these networks are. And this is an example from the Netherlands, where we've now established the victimology knowledge network, VINE. And in this network, uh, we try to establish a structural cooperation between practice policy and various scientific disciplines. So not only law, but also psychology, economy. And the goal is to stimulate an exchange of knowledge and cooperation between these sectors. Um, and instead of focusing on 
one one off issue what we now try to do is truly follow various victims so perhaps more classical victims but also um, different victims that have not been um, investigated thoroughly just yet uh, think of cyber victims or perhaps um, lgbtiq plus victims mm -hmm. and to really follow them in throughout the entire journey that they go through after they have become victimized for the first time so we're not only looking at the criminal justice procedure huh, from the beginning towards the end but also what health services um, do they tap into um, are they making use of victim support how do these organizations uh, match um, when it comes to their goals and and to the help they provide to victims. So a more holistic approach, if you will, um, and a, a longer term vision on research as well. So that in a nutshell is uh, my vision on how academia can have a bigger impact on uh, victims issues or perhaps victim support. But I'm very curious to learn about your vision as well. So I would like to address the question right back at you. Uh, how can academia be more at your service? I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Suzanne. You, you've uh, given us a lot to unpack there. I think this is just going to be, again, the start of conversations. Uh, I really hope that uh, as we launch Victim Sports Europe's online hub, uh, we'll be able to encourage, encourage uh, yourself and academics like you to, to be part of that and to have these discussions further. I think there's a huge amount of benefit to that joint working, both in terms of supporting academics with, with uh, their work, making the research practical, but also supporting um, academic rigor within the work of uh, organizations like victim support organizations. So uh, we have a lot of opportunities there. I think that your questions about uh, what is being done, how are we doing this are really important. Um, and I think that uh, we've experienced the, the benefits of working with the academia I, I, and also doing the research. You mentioned about access to research. It's always a big struggle. Um, and I rely on it so much for our Vociari project. Um, I, I looked at a doctoral research into the distribution of police stations in South Africa to help us analyze about access to victim support services and how to make it more effective. So a lot to work on in many different ways. Uh, we even have uh, developing internship relationships with universities which has massively benefited us we had a, have we've had some wonderful interns so let's keep up that up and find out ways to develop those relationships across Europe thank you Suzanne um just a reminder for everyone I understand that my link my my wi-fi wasn't working so well if you haven't seen it the links for the side events are in the chat uh, make sure you copy that somewhere download it um once we leave the plenary sessions you won't be able to re-access the chat area so check out the links in the chat uh, and keep talking. So let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, we're moving to a different area, which is uh, the, the media. Uh, we all know that the media contributes a huge amount to awareness, knowledge and recognition for victims, but we also know um, that it can uh, also pose some problems for victims uh, and can themselves as journalists also be threatened and, and face victimization. So we, I have the great pleasure now of uh, introducing uh, a very well-known uh, journalist over here in Belgium, Mr. Uh, Farouk Özgenesh. I'm saying it in a Turkish way. Uh, I hope that's the okay way of doing it. Um, he's a journalist and news host for the Flemish television broadcasting company, VTM. And since 2008, he combined his work as a news host with presenting the information program, Telefacts. Since 2011, he's specialized in crime reporting for the Daily News, and he became the face of the crime victim, crime investigation program, Telefax Crime. So today, as I said, Farouk will be talking about the journalist's role in covering victims' issues, as well as the, the challenges that journalists face, including the violence that they face. Farouk, the floor is yours, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the kind introduction, Levin. Um, first of all, I would like to emphasize that I am here not speaking on behalf of the media. I've been working as a journalist for 30 years and I'm speaking here entirely on uh, my own behalf. 
Um, as a crime uh, journalist, uh, you inevitably come into contact with uh, victims during your work, victims of a serious incident, victims of a brutal robbery, victims of a, a terrorist attack. And uh, all too often, the journalist's work uh, seems to focus on the perpetrator. Um, for example, in the case of a terror attack, uh, the, his uh, description, uh, the actions of the perpetrator, his background, sometimes it leads to a very uh, extensive uh, profile. Uh, this is, of course, due to the fact that the police is also sharing all these uh, information, not only the police, but also judicial um, authorities. And the victim or victims uh, of such an act often remain in uh, the background. And this is, of course, due to uh, reasons of privacy. Uh, their names are not publicly uh, disclosed. And victims do not want their identity to be revealed without their uh, consent unless they go public themselves. So this is a very thin field in which media and uh, victims uh, act. And of course, as a journalist, you want to uh, report in a balanced way and also highlight the side of uh, the victim. Question is, of course, if uh, whether that, this is also what the victim wants. Um, from my experience, um, I know there are two types of um, victims, or probably more, but I'm just talking from my own experience. You have uh, a victim who cannot stop talking about uh, the suffering that has happened to him or her. And everyone uh, is allowed to know what has happened uh, to him or her. And like a mantra, every detail is repeated over and over again. And it seems as if uh, the victim is stuck in that role and uh, they only see one way out, namely constantly reliving that uh, event. It may be a way of uh, processing uh, that trauma, but here, here as a journalist, you have, of course, a certain responsibility and, and caution is uh, required. There are also um, people who tend to keep their suffering to themselves and, and they do not want to talk about it uh, with their, not even with their surroundings, uh, let alone with a journalist. Um, and for such victims, there is only one rule as a journalist, you just leave them alone. There is no point in uh, trying to persuade them uh, to say something after, after all. Um, there are people who have not processed their own suffering and have not yet given it a place. And when they are ready, uh, they will contact the press themselves. Uh, I've seen this attitude uh, in the victims of the terrorist attack, attacks in, uh, in Belgium on uh, March 22nd, uh, 2016. And uh, those attacks happened at the uh, Zaventem airport and at the Brussels uh, metro station. And uh, 32 uh, innocent people lost their lives during those uh, terrorist attacks. And uh, there were also hundreds of um, people who got uh, injured. Um, some 700 uh, people have registered themselves um, with the court as a, a civil party parties, that means as, uh, as victims. And possibly there are many, many more because uh, there are also people who are who were glad that they survived these attacks. Uh, were at the airport or on the subway that day, but who escaped the, the horror unharmed. And people who deal with their grief in their own way and who do not even want to make themselves uh, known uh, to the public or to judicial of, uh, authorities for whatever reason. And that is something we have to uh, respect too. Some of uh, the known uh, 
victims uh, who have registered themselves have grouped themselves in various um, uh, groups to defend their uh, interests. And uh, five years after these attacks, um, many uh, of these victims see that their medical uh, expenses uh, are barely uh, reimbursed, that uh, they do not are not well informed about uh, their rights as a, as a victim. We hear stories about uh, insurance companies who are very difficult about uh, payments. People uh, who have an have undergone an amputation and are required to go to a medical exam every year to confirm that their lost uh, arm or leg is still absent. These are very sad experiences where victims um, do seek the press uh, to tell the story of their uh, ordeal. And um, I can tell you that uh, when I first contact, when you as a journalist first contact victims, uh, you always present yourself. You say who you are and what the reason is you contact these people. You don't impose yourself or uh, you just... Um, you just assume that your question will be rejected. You get a no, or you expect a no. Uh, if you get a yes, that, that means that's very positive. And even if people do not want to talk to you, that's a very legitimate uh, act to do. And if you get a yes, it means that the person is uh, on the other side is at least open to a conversation, uh, or at least not reluctant about it. And even once the, the conversation continues, still numerous conditions um, apply. Uh, the victim, for example, may ask uh, to read the text of, uh, of an interview. Um, and of course, this should be done uh, Unless, of course, there's a certain urgency, you have a, a deadline to meet, or it's not practically possible to, uh, to provide the text. And a, a victim can also ask for certain uh, parts of the text to be left out, um, if, uh, even if they have said uh, certain things, but they do not feel comfortable about it afterwards. Um, I also... Uh, when I talk to uh, to victims, I also try I also try uh, to make sure that, uh, if possible, there's always somebody on um, someone extra on the victim side who's present during such an such an interview. It's not to control what uh, the person is saying, but uh, this may be a, a support for the victim. Uh, when it becomes, for example, very difficult to talk about uh, certain experiences. In, uh, in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview, as a, an inexperienced and vulnerable uh, victim, you can be at the mercy of a, a very seasoned uh, reporter who knows exactly uh, what, which quotes uh, are uh, interesting uh, for him and he may take the conversation to places where the victim doesn't want to go. So um, for politicians, people in sports and entertainment, contact with uh, journalists, with the press, are uh, an everyday occurrence. But for most people, it is uncharted territory, and uh, they sometimes do not know what the impact is of uh, what they have uh, said. Um, most people are not also not very familiar with the journalist journalistic concepts um, such as uh, information on the record, information off the record, embargoes on uh, publication, or uh, uh, the right to be uh, to be he heard when you're mentioned in the, in an article. Um, therefore, uh, a first interview with a journalist uh, can sometimes be a very overwhelming. Uh, experience that may leave a victim uh, worrying afterwards about whether it was a good decision to talk or to testify. 
and uh, they stay in, in uncertainty about what will ultimately uh, be reflected in an article or in a, in a report. Um, in Belgium, uh, we have um, a council for journalism. This is a, a self-regulating uh, body where, in addition to journalists uh, and publishers, there are also people from outside the press who represent uh, society or the public, such as academia or, uh, or business. And uh, in total, uh, the Council uh, for Journalism has 36 members, uh, equally divided in the 12 representatives of uh, each group, just uh, to avoid uh, the idea that the Council is just a mere club of uh, journalists who decide about their peers and uh, what they decide is nobody else's uh, business. So the aim of this council is to achieve a balanced uh, composition. And uh, this council meets uh, every month. By the way, I have an app appointment, uh, an online meeting uh, at noon. So after this uh, uh, online meeting. And um, so this council also discusses complaints uh, from people about um, their encounters uh, with the press. It's uh, not the press, uh, people have complaints about the press, but not the press in general, but people who have been interviewed and who are not very satisfied with the result. Uh, people who feel that certain uh, agreements were not kept, people who feel that their privacy was violated because too many personal details, details were included in, uh, in, the, in the coverage and that were actually not necessary to tell the story, such as family situation or the work. So um, uh, you have people who complain that uh, uh, their image uh, was used from social media without uh, permission. Um, people uh, who complain that they have been misquoted or sometimes even people uh, who read, uh, who find out that they have given an interview without even having, having spoken to a journalist. I mean, these cases actually uh, exist. And uh, on all these matters, the council uh, makes uh, uh, pronouncements. Last year, 41, this year, uh, 42, and the counter for this year is 16. Now, an average of 40 may not seem a lot, but this, these are people who eventually take a step to file a complaint against uh, a medium, which is um, not so, not so, excuse me, not so obvious to do. And um, the journalists, th this council also answers questions about the professional ethics uh, of journalists. And uh, as a point of reference, uh, the council has drawn up a code of conduct uh, with guidelines. And uh, it covers all aspects of journalistic work. And uh, an important chapter uh, also is also devoted to dealing um, with victims. And uh, one of the uh, journalistic principles is about fair play. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, the journalist uses loyal methods to obtain or process information, information, image, or sound recordings and uh, documents. And uh, the journalist does not abuse his capacity, especially towards people in a vulner vulnerable situation, such as minors, victims of crime, disaster, disasters and accidents, and their immediate um, environment. And uh, another principle is about respect for private life and uh, human dignity. So uh, the journalist, uh, this is one of the rules, the journalist respects the suffering of victims and their immediate environment. He, he does not intrude inappropriately uh, in his news gathering. There's also um, a guideline about uh, the use of information and images from uh, social media and personal websites. Uh, especially towards uh, victims. So the journalist takes into account uh, the rights of everybody to appear, who appears in reporting. 
and he shall weigh those rights against the the social interest of the information. So it's it's a matter of of balance. And um, if the person concerned has restricted access to information or images on social media or personal website, use is in principle not allowed. So the journalist must demonstrate uh, a weighty social interest in order to justify the use uh, of those uh, uh, images. And if not, you will have, you will have, is obliged to ask for permission from uh, the person uh, concerned. Farouk, so, sorry, you have five minutes left for your presentation. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so if it appears that uh, victims uh, or their immediate uh, families are opposed to being taken over um, uh, and disclosed, the journalist will have to respect this. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Okay. So, um, so the journalist has to respect the private life of, uh, of individuals and um, it should be very cautious about uh, reporting about uh, uh, victims. And um, if the journalist uh, depicts victims, uh, he will have to weigh the social interest uh, against the rights of the victims and their immediate uh, surroundings. So if he decides to make victims unrecognizable, he has to do it in a very effective uh, way. And uh, as far as possible, the journalist has to take into account the request of a victim or his uh, immediate uh, surrounding not to be identified. Any identification of victims for example, of, uh, of social of sexual abuse, is even prohibited uh, prohibited by law uh, unless unless there is a, a written consent um, of that uh, person or, or of a magistrate. So um, to end, uh, despite all these clear guidelines, uh, we in the council still note uh, that these complaints keep coming in. I must say that people um, are also becoming more outspoken and they also insist on their rights, which I believe is a, is a very good thing, but we still uh, have a, a long way uh, to cover. I would like to conclude here. I see that uh, the hour of the coffee break is approaching. So thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Farouk. I, I think uh, you had a huge amount of, of important information to provide there. I think the, the, the difficulties faced by journalists in terms of knowing how to work with victims and, and the importance of having these protocols, these rules to protect victims uh, is essential. I think we heard about the the way that, that journalists and the media can amplify the voice of victims and really reflect um, the experiences that they've had and raise awareness, but also that they have this uh, important role to, to protect victims when they are engaging with them. Uh, it's great to hear about the Council of Journalists. I, I wonder if there, that there is a victim support organisation or specialist on that council. Um, but I think what it, what it tells us is, is that there is an opportunity across Europe and globally for support, uh, victim support experts to engage with, with these councils, with journalists and, and really be part of the preparation and understanding of what victims need. So thank you for that introduction. Welcome back, everybody. It's 11.15, so we will uh, continue without further ado. Just a reminder that, that we've been contacted by an MEP um, requesting information on um, ways in which um, contact with uh, between victims and perpetrators can be avoided or prevented when they're seeking to enforce uh, court orders. Um, this is extremely important. The European Union is will, in all probability, be producing new legislation in the next couple of years, specifically on gender-based violence, on violence against women. Uh, and we have a chance to make sure that it, it, it works for uh, victims as much as possible. I don't know if you can hear that there's drilling going on now. Uh, if it's too noisy, I'll move somewhere else. In any case, I really hope you can send in your, your experiences, information about how governments avoid that kind of problem. I think perhaps, for example, in the Netherlands, they have solutions. Uh, moving on now, we have the uh, second part of today's session where we've heard earlier about specialised support academ academia and uh, journalists. We're now moving on to look at how 
support is provided within governmental institutions, but also um, how, how it can be delivered within the context of the justice system and uh, in the health sector. Our first speaker in this session is uh, Mari Tikepu. Uh, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce that perfectly. I, uh, I'm trying to improve my Estonian now. We're working with, with the Estonian government and, and victim support in Estonia is a, is a standing member of Victim Sports Europe for the last couple of years. So uh, Mary is the head of Victim Sports Unit at the Department of Victim Support and Prevention Services for the Estonian Social Insurance Board, and they are the primary uh, support service in Estonia. I hand the floor now to you, Mary. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And Levent, it was correctly how you said my name. So everything's good. I will share my screen. Uh, so you can uh, see uh, also the presentation that I have for today. And, uh, and hi again. Yes, like Levent said, uh, I'm the head of Victim Support Unit. And um, it, the unit belongs in the Department of uh, Victim Support and um, Prevention Services. And um, it also belongs, this department is in the Social Insurance Board. Um, when when we uh, when we talk about victim support in Estonian social insurance board, then um, uh, I have to start with that we are governmentally funded, and uh, why I'm uh, saying this uh, in the beginning of uh, my presentation, I will uh, bring it up uh, several times because um, when uh, when there was this opportunity to talk about this um, governmentally funded uh, system uh, in this uh, uh, meeting uh, and then uh, when I talked about uh, with the victim support Europe uh, uh, people from victim support Europe uh, then um, what I heard is that um, or actually it's some kind of myth uh, somehow that uh, when the system is governmentally funded then it may sound like everything is so good everything is um, more uh, how do you say stable and um, i think it's some kind of myth that i'm uh, trying to break not to say that everything is um, really critical but i want to uh, some kind of uh, put a, a challenge on the table to see like is it really so different from uh, ngos and um, what kind of challenges we have in our uh, system here in estonia so um, when we talk about the victim support in Estonia, then we uh, have uh, had uh, services uh, for almost 17 years. It's a pretty uh, long time. Uh, I was really young when they started because I'm only 30 at the moment. And I've been in the system for almost three years. And um, to be honest, when I think about for these uh, three years, there has been a pretty good, pretty big development and we will get to uh, this um, uh, development part also. But um, uh, at the moment, uh, we have this annual budget uh, for 6 million euros. It sounds a lot of money, to be honest, uh, even for me uh, in this system. But is it really that big? Because when, I, uh, when we think, uh, uh, when we look into this uh, budget, then we are covering 12 services. Uh, we are covering... Uh, uh, also benefits for victims of crimes and uh, also 27 victim support workers who work uh, all over the country in police stations. And uh, when we look into these services, then we have uh, services for human trafficking uh, victims. We have uh, women's support shelters. We have services for renouncing violence. I also included uh, the hotline. That we opened uh, last year. We also have 116006 uh, uh, helpline. Uh, we have services for victims of sexual uh, violence, uh, secure care for uh, children and youth. We have uh, MDFT therapy. We have restor uh, restorative justice services. We have um, 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 uh, psychological crisis uh, aid in emergency situations and uh, also uh, international protection services, uh, which includes also asylum seekers. So when you think about all this um, uh, variety of these services and, um, 
and the number of victims that we have, then uh, um, I'm not so sure that it's uh, enough. But um, I think we are doing pretty good uh, with this kind of uh, budget. Um, when, when I said in the beginning that uh, about this myth uh, that um, uh, governmentally funded systems are so different and uh, they are a bit um, privileged, uh, that this is some kind of myth that I've heard. I hope a lot of people that uh, are listening don't carry this kind of myth because I think there are a lot uh, more similarities uh, with uh, NGOs but I have to agree that there are uh, some differences uh, also. So let's look into this. When I think about our system in Estonia, then I am really proud and I'm so glad that my colleagues uh, also in, uh, in our uh, organization are really proud of that we have so good and effective cooperation with ministries. And um, somehow uh, when people think that when we are governmentally funded, then ministries say, well, this is the money and this is what you have to do. Uh, but um, what I'm really proud of is that uh, actually in Estonia, I like to think that the uh, social insurance board is actually like uh, we have this status of competence center. For example, we can give input uh, in um, policy making and uh, we have the voice. So what happens when you have a, a voice is that you also have responsibility. So uh, this is the part what I really like, and uh, this is the part when we get to this um, uh, development part, we can uh, look into this, what it means when you have uh, this uh, much, uh, this big responsibility for helping and, uh, and providing services for victims. Um, it, it does provide uh, some kind of financial security also, um, but we also have project-based uh, funding, so I think this is something that is uh, really similar uh, when we talk about NGOs, that uh, uh, there are services that uh, we, like easy way saying is that we don't have to worry, uh, that uh, someday the money will be out. But uh, a lot of services also are uh, project-based. So we also have to write the project. We have to fight for uh, um, saying that why we need uh, the money and why we need to provide this or that uh, service. Um, what I really like to think is that um, uh, about this responsibility part is that uh, we really have this ab uh, ability and the opportunity to design services for uh, different uh, target groups. Um, to be honest, uh, this part is also uh, what I'm a bit critical about. And uh, when I listen to myself, uh, then uh, I think there's a lot of uh, critical thinking about um, the way our system uh, works. But I think it's uh, something that uh, we have to keep in mind when we uh, think, when we work with victims, is that we can't uh, stop uh, there when we think that we have everything. I don't think we have everything. And it doesn't matter if you're NGO or your governmental uh, institution. I think we, uh, w w when I wrote this um, uh, point on my slide, this ability to design services, is that we also, uh, have to think all the time, like, are all our services working uh, for helping the victims? Are they designed for their actual needs or are they something that we think they may need? So um, when, uh, when you have uh, this kind of power, uh, you, uh, especially when I think in this uh, financial aspect, is that you, you, you have to be uh, even more uh, in this topic with your heart, uh, I think. Um, what is really good is that uh, when I think about this accessibility uh, uh, point is that uh, uh, we do have uh, services when I think about victim support uh, workers, they're in every county, uh, county, they work in police stations. We also have 24 seven uh, open helpline, uh, 116-006. Uh, for uh, uh, it's um, open since uh, 2019. 
And I think we have uh, made a lot of improvements for uh, providing uh, this availability and accessibility uh, to the victims. And, um, and I think uh, when, when compared to NGOs that uh, it's not so um, maybe um, easy uh, for being everywhere because uh, well because all of these resources uh, aspect I mean uh, human based and, and financial um, and the spokesman in the field is um, what I think about uh, when, when you listen you can think about uh, is it something that is uh, uh, really special to the governmental institution or NGOs I think it's it's the same because uh, uh, like I said previously, when you have this uh, uh, voice, you have this uh, well said power uh, in a good way. Uh, I mean, then I think the way how you use it, uh, it's up to you. And um, and I'm really proud when I think about our victim support workers, when I, when I think about different uh, uh, service providers, uh, I mean, NGOs, for example, uh, I mean, women's uh, support centers, then uh, they all have um, this, um, I think it's some kind of inner burning or, uh, or I think it's some kind of mission in them when they, um, it's not, they, they're not only focusing their everyday work, but I think they're carrying in themselves this uh, uh, higher need for being also the spokesman in the field. And um, I, I think as a governmental uh, institution or actually uh, our organization fully, uh, when I think about uh, being in social field is that uh, we, we take it really serious that we have this possibility to carry out, uh, to um, provide uh, this, um, a view of this uh, field and uh, not just to um, settle with uh, this kind of uh, point where we are standing at the moment, but uh, to understand that uh, it's uh, in our hand uh, if we want to make some kind of uh, difference in the field. But uh, like I said, it's not uh, only our organization that we are uh, carrying this uh, kind of mindset. We also have really great uh, women's uh, support shelters. We have uh, many um, service providers in, uh, for example, psychological help, who are taking this uh, um, protecting victims' rights and, uh, and being the spokesman in the field, uh, really serious. And, uh, and I'm really glad uh, about it. Um, when I think about this uh, 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 timeline, that when we uh, started in 2003, and now we have 2021, it will be almost 17 years. Uh, this uh, governmentally provided uh, services. And um, I guess you've heard that uh, there is a lot of, uh, there's a versatility of services that um, we have developed. When we started uh, in 2003, I've heard these um, uh, interesting stories from my uh, victim support uh, workers that uh, they had this really small table somewhere in police station. They didn't even have a chair and they have to be uh, like all the times behind these doors and like, we can help, we are there. And when I think about today, uh, all this um, awareness rising and, uh, and all this um, effort that they are putting in and, uh, when I think about our partners in different fields, then uh, it makes me really proud. But uh, I also like to think that somehow we are still in, uh, in the year of 2003, because when I think about the statistics and uh, uh, the number of new cases uh, every year, and um, if you don't know, then uh, the population in Estonia is 1.3 million. And um, every year there will be new cases around uh, uh, 3,000 in the victim support by the, the number of uh, victim support workers. 
uh, directly work plus the cases that we have from uh, uh, helpline or uh, uh, women uh, support uh, centers and um, i think it's really small and uh, i think uh, this is something that uh, we are keeping in our mind that uh, even though we have opened so many uh, doors for victims and we have uh, developed many services for different uh, target groups uh, but we can't put them uh, when when the victim is in need then we can't think that uh, it's, it's really good if uh, if uh, she or he knows our number or she knows where the victim support worker uh, is working i think this is something that we have to uh, uh, take more serious that uh, uh, how to reach them uh, on that moment, even if they don't have this, because they don't have to carry out this responsibility for getting help. We as a as a governmental institution have to take the responsibility for for being there for them when they need it. And um, I will talk you uh, two cases, uh, for example, uh, where we are. Uh, but um, but also when I think about this, um, th this actually what I just said is uh, also this proactivity and uh, awareness uh, rising point also. But um, uh, I think my time will be soon uh, out. So it's, it's I will five just... Five minutes, Mari. Five minutes. Okay. Thank okay. You. Good. So I can talk about these uh, two examples for uh, showing this... Uh, um, I think improvements that we uh, uh, have to implement, but uh, I think this is something that uh, all uh, everybody that you're listening and who are working in victim support systems uh, are challenging uh, or chuckling. So um, the first case is: uh, Can you take her home with you? It's actually uh, a case. Uh, not so far ago, uh, uh, when victim support worker was um, working uh, with uh, a victim, and uh, the case was uh, it was really good case because uh, what I mean by good is that um, uh, the, the the cooperation between different partners. I mean police. I mean uh, uh, social services and our victim support uh, system, uh, it was really good. And uh, it was so good that the, the contact the victim support, uh, uh, victim support worker had with the victim um, was uh, so close that uh, the one partner from the system uh, said that uh, maybe you can take her home with you because we know victim support uh, uh, in, in Estonia, we know in social insurance board, it's so good, you're doing so good job and we, we trust you and we have faith in you and, uh, and you can do really good uh, with her. And uh, of course, she didn't take her home with, uh, uh, with, uh, with her. But um, what I'm trying to show you is that there, is, uh, there are many partners that are really aware of our services. They are aware of the victim support systems. They have all these materials. Uh, they are also some sort of a spokesman. But um, the other example, uh, what we are... <laughs> We also have many, many cases uh, like this is actually uh, from uh, today's morning, actually, from the newspaper. And it's a case of a, a sexual uh, victim of sexual violence. And um, the police um, officer said that uh, when the victim uh, got help from them uh, and uh, um, and their next step was uh, actually, I'm quoting uh, him, is that, uh, and sometimes we will refer the victim to victim support worker. And uh, what it shows me is that um, it's just one example, but uh, the understanding, and I'm, I'm repeating myself that victim support workers are working in police stations. And we have many, many police workers. Actually, we have in different fields of uh, uh, experts in different fields who are not aware of our services, even though we have been uh, here for over 16 years. 
And um, that's why I'm a bit critical, uh, is that uh, even though we have been, uh, we are governmentally funded, we have so many services, we have uh, a lot of doors for victims we have opened, but we are still uh, struggling for, uh, with these uh, attitudes, with these uh, mindsets. But what we are uh, challenging is uh, not the most, but what is really uh, uh, important for me is that um, this um, reachability or, or accessibility is that we have to uh, start with our uh, partners because I think. Um, yeah, we have done a lot of good work because uh, we're not struggling with this kind of attitudes. Like uh, sometimes we will refer, sometimes we won't. I don't know uh, if there is a victim support or if there is. I'm not sure if they know what they're doing or or what is victim support. These are all kind of questions that we have uh, monthly when our victim support workers are doing presentations in police stations and. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge this, and uh, and this is our opportunity uh, and our responsibility uh, for being a governmental uh, institution uh, that we have to understand what kind of uh, power in a good way we have and what kind of uh, opportunities we have for every time we hear this kind of. Uh, mm, saying that uh, sometimes we will, sometimes we don't. It depends on my mood, knowledge, whatever. And, uh, and also what we are challenging is this uh, data aspect uh, and also in prevention uh, aspect when I think about how to get to the victims uh, before something happens. I don't think we have used all this knowledge and all this data we have at the moment for designing uh, these kind of approaches and, uh, and also this uh, data for cooperation in different uh, fields, uh, law enforcement, uh, healthcare, uh, education, that, um, that uh, we have to deal with and we have to prioritize uh, this, um, these points also. So thank you uh, for listening. If you have any further questions or if you have any questions, I don't know if you have because I don't see you. <laughs> I see only my slide. So don't hesitate to write me or visit the uh, social insurance um, for the website. Thank you, thank you. Marie. Thank, thank you so much, Marie. I think uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought. <clears throat> I think it's extremely important for us to hear from the different sectors which are delivering victim support. Uh, I'll start off by a, an extremely important point you made and which you've shown in your own presentation, which is it's in your heart. Um, I, I think uh, it's easy to think that uh, certain kinds of organizations are the ones that should deliver, but, but it's really about the fundamental principles of how you deliver uh, and how can governmental institutions <clears throat> engender some of those fundamental principles, starting with having it in your heart, uh, demonstrating the, the willingness to question the services and to continuously look to improve, uh, to have that fle flexibility and versatility, as you said it, um, to find ways to meet the needs of victims, as, as we said yesterday, it's uh, rights-based rights uh, needs driven. So I think uh, we've heard a lot there, the complementarity between governmental actions and uh, civil society actions. We as Victim Support Europe are working closely with the Estonian government and we see a spirit of, uh, and a desire to make a difference for victims. Uh, and that that really makes a difference in the way that, that the government works and we see it also in the way that you work. So thank you for that presentation. Let's move now to uh, another area, which is the justice area. And I, and I have the uh, great pleasure, <coughs> excuse me, of the great pleasure to uh, invite Anita Geneva to speak now. Uh, Anita has been the legal monitor for the Mental Disability Advocacy Centre in Sofia, Bulgaria since June 2005. And she has experience in cooperating with Bulgarian NGOs, such as the Gender Research Foundation uh, and the Pernik Center for Protection of Women and Children Victims of Violence by supporting their activ 
advocacy activities. She's an attorney at law and really understands the, the, the uh, issues around being a lawyer and working for victims, but she's also a former judge as well. So she brings a lot of knowledge from the justice sector. So thank you, Anissa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm uh, glad uh, to be here and to share with you um, a little part of my experience uh, um, uh, with the justice system. Um, actually, uh, I'm working uh, with uh, people with disabilities for more than 15 years now. Uh, currently, I'm working in close cooperation with uh, Validity Foundation, uh, which is uh, working uh, worldwide. And also I'm in cooperation, I'm working in close cooperation with Disability Rights Intervention and many other organizations uh, in Bulgaria and um, in Europe. Um, recently, we are... Um, establish a network of the independent lawyers, uh, which is uh, unique for my perspective, uh, um, a way to organize uh, people and to work together with uh, them, not be, um, not be united uh, in one organization. But it's uh, something else. Let me start uh, with my stories. In uh, some uh, of my cases, uh, when the person with disability went through inhuman and degrading treatment, like uh, physical, psychological, uh, economical, emotional abuse or deprivation of uh, liberty, this experience was uh, not considered as a crime. So because of that, uh, no uh, criminal case uh, started and the person had never been recognized as a person who had uh, experienced trauma. Sometimes uh, this person's experience is going so long and uh, uh, it was so damaging that if he or she was not a person with a disability, everybody would immediately recognize the sign of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Uh, the experience of the encounter with the justice system in so many cases made me think uh, and uh, look uh, about the need to have trauma-informed justice system and to ensure the victims' access to justice where they will not be retromised uh, by wrong, ill-informed practice or to become direct uh, victim of discrimination and uh, their experience will be considered. Unfortunately, the justice, justice uh, system is uh, not uh, victims uh, friendly and there is a long way before the courtrooms will start offer uh, proper support, support to the victims. The negative examples are more than the positive, but the good news is that some positive practice already exists. However, I'm not going uh, to speak about all examples that exist uh, worldwide. I will share with you several true stories uh, for my professional practice. The first story, first, uh, story is um, about a young uh, Roma girl who was a victim of human trafficking. Because of some elements of her personal story, she became an easy victim of the tra trafficking mafia in her town. He took year, it took years until she managed to escape. She had a psychiatric diagnosis as a result of her experience with violence during the trafficking. She was brave enough to seek justice, but unfortunately the justice system was not enough prepared to meet her needs. The main problem was the interrogation. She was interrogated six times in four years, two times during the criminal investigation and four times during the court procedure. I have to assure you that during the whole procedure, we made enormous efforts to convince the judge to have a more delicate, informed and trauma-informed approach. It never happened. The judge, a male judge, together with two more members of the jury panel, interrogated the victim in the presence of the perpetrator, asking her for brutal details how she was sexually, physically, and emotionally abused by the same person who was in the same courtroom. 
The lawyer of the perpetrator ironically commented her words and the judge didn't stop him even after our very strong objections. We lost this case and appealed the decision. The next instance court abolished the decision. This means in my country court system that the case must start uh, from very beginning and uh, the victim must be interrogated again. The next court, uh, acted in a little bit uh, better way, but still the interrogation happened in the front of the perpetrator in a rude manner. The final decision was not good enough for the victim and when we appeal again. And again, the, the case started since the very beginning. And this happened one, one more time. Finally, we won the case, but during the struggle with the justice system, my client's psychological condition became worse. She was tired and lost her strength. <clears throat> Soon after the decision, she became a victim again, and uh, since then, she became a constant patient of the psychiatric hospital where she was treated for her symptoms, but uh, did not receive proper psychological support for the trauma she had suffered. To illustrate how easy the court may have applied opposite attitude, let me share another story with you. It is about a girl victim of sexual abuse. The perpetrator was her father. In the beginning, during the first instance court procedure, the judge's approach was exactly the same as in the previous case. The judge asked and ask even it was visible that this kind of interrogation is causing psychological pain to the girl. Again, me and my colleagues made enormous efforts to convince the judge to consider the age, trauma and pain of the victim. Nothing helped. We lost the case, but the next instance court had another approach. The judge accept our request to facilitate the process with more sensitive to the trauma uh, way, including how the sites uh, must enter in the, co in the court. Each site had instructions uh, to enter uh, in the court building from opposite, opposite sides. The victim was invited to a room close to the courtroom where the rest of the participants of the case were the opposite side lawyer and the judge. This means that the court took all necessary uh, measures to prevent the um, meeting between the perpetrator and victim because the judge was informed that even the, the, the short meeting may, may cause big stress to the victim. Uh, these uh, measures include the preparation uh, and uh, also the judge uh, ensure enough time to the victim uh, that the whole procedure, the whole uh, uh, hearing took almost a day because the judge gave uh, time to the victim to have a rest, to think, uh, um, to breathe. Uh, so she, has, uh, she had uh, space and time uh, to speak in a very calm way with the judge. And in the end, uh, she was able to share her truth with the court. Uh, for me, this was real justice. The girl had the strength to go further uh, after that uh, and uh, in the end to heal trauma in some way. Uh, for me, these two uh, examples are illustrative how the power uh, are illustrative for the power of the justice system to harm and to be part of the healing. But let's explore several cases which are far from the criminal justice and to see how um, the lack of trauma-informed approach may harm people who have to deal with different time of uh, cases. Probably some of uh, you uh, are familiar with uh, European care uh, sorry, European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, case, uh, Rusistanev versus Bulgaria. Um, 
Rossi Stanev was a person with uh, psychological disabilities placed because of his disability in an institution for men with psychosocial disabilities. The number of men placed there was around 100. The institution was in a remote area. The conditions were terrible. He spent more than eight years there. He was deprived from his legal capacity and de facto hadn't any control over his entire life starting from place where he was forced to live, the daily routine, the choice with whom to live and uh, whom to meet, when to smoke, what and when to eat. The conditions were terrible, cold, lack of warm water, dirty rooms shared with many other people, damaged buildings, violence between users and sometimes violence from the personnel. After a fight for Russia's freedom on domestic level, we reached the European Court of uh, Human Rights and won the case. The court issued a decision recognizing the violation of Article 3, 5, 6, and 13 uh, uh, under the uh, European Convention for Human Rights. The court <clears throat> recognized the fact that Russia was exposed to inhuman and degrading conditions, deprived from his liberty, and that his rights were severely, severely violated. After we won this case, we started a case on domestic level for restoration of uh, Russia's uh, legal capacity. During the court procedure, the judge appointed a psychiatric expert to give his opinion about Russia's psychosocial uh, condition. The expert explained in the front of the court that the best conditions for Russia and people like him, uh, people with psychosocial disability, uh, are to be placed uh, in uh, institutions. The judge, even he knows, uh, he knew very well the European Court of Human Rights decision, uh, was not uh, well informed about the trauma and uh, what uh, it may cause. Uh, so he never uh, took under question the expert uh, opinion. So in the end, both the expert and the judge didn't recognize the traumatic experience of my client. It's important to mention, as you definitely know, that trauma experience uh, may affect a person's physical health, mental health, and its ability to respond successfully to treatment and other intervention. The response to the traumatic experience may overlap the symptoms of the psychotic crisis and the psychosocial disability. But unfortunately, at least in my country, but I'm sure not only, once the person is labeled as a person with psychosocial disabilities, it seems the experts forget this. Uh, but, we all meet the person in concrete moment of uh, his or her life, and uh, we cannot know what the person went through before that. The same was the story of Rusi Stanev. He was not just a client of me. We had a joint journey for several years. I traveled with him across Europe, and after the after we won won the case before the European Court of Human Rights, and I was a witness of his evolution from victim to advocate uh, for. Um, uh, human rights. I, I witness uh, an unique uh, process of realization of the trauma and the post-traumatic potential. During this time, I learned a lot about Rusi's story. He was abandoned from his mother and grew up uh, with his father and his stepmother in a family condition where domestic violence was a norm. When he was a teenager, he was deprived from his liberty and placed in a special school for boys with behavioral problems, which is a type of institution. This happened during the socialism when all East, East, uh, Western European music was prohibited. But Rusi managed to listen and even to play it, and it costed him his freedom. Then he grew up, he had problem with alcohol and problem with his uh, stepsister. And long, long story short, he ended up in the institution described above. This short story reveals the story of repetitive trauma and the above mentioned eight years were just a part of the whole traumatic experience. In the Russia Stanev case, both expert and judge didn't recognize psychosocial, psychosocial problem my client had as possible consequences from severe traumatic experience and much worse, they didn't recognize the human 
my client and general human potential to recover after such a trauma. Blind for the trauma, the court decided not to abolish a Rusi guardianship. This practically means in my country context that the person doesn't have any control over his own life and somebody else will make decisions for every single element of his life. Do you see how this situation is very similar to those in the institution? The court don't my client to live in the conditions which remind him the traumatic experience forever. Of course, we appeal this decision, but unfortunately, Rusi did not live enough to see the end of the, this uh, trial. The time I have to speak is not enough to share with you all stories I collected during my professional part, but I would, would like to use the short time I still have to share some other thoughts in the same direction. In my country, the person who are placed under guardianship can be placed in institution or a group home, which is a smaller institution, only with a court decision. The same is the rule for all children. The court has the obligation to hear the person. The person who needs to seek the shelter and who is dependent from care is a person who most probably went through some kind of traumatic event or through many tra traumatic events. I know, I know in person many women and girls who were placed in such institutions after they went through sexual abuse, for example. Many people who were placed in such conditions because uh, they became victims of severe neglect, economic crime, etc. As through their conditions, after they had be, been uh, a victim of such a crimes, uh, may look as psychotic uh, crisis. And because of that, or because of the fact they cannot communicate in the usual way, or because they are labeled already as persons with psychosocial disabilities, the crime against them as rule is not investigated. They are victims, their experience damaged them uh, dramatically, but they have, they have encounters with the justice system only when the court must decide whether they should be placed in institution. In general case, the judges uh, who work on these cases don't have other information besides their diagnosis and the proposal for the placement. Aneta, uh, sorry, you have three minutes left. Thank okay. You. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so <clears throat> the judges very easy decide that there is no actual reason to um, uh, to hurt the, the person and they don't uh, take any additional uh, efforts to ensure a, a reasonable accom accommodation for uh, the persons to be heard in the courtroom. But you know that um, trauma su survivors have um, uh, difficulties to uh, communicate properly with the court and exactly this uh, happened with these people. Uh, but uh, in many cases, the uh, judges decide that uh, this means uh, this is a part of the psychosocial condition of the, this person or the communication is not possible generally. Uh, in Bulgaria, I know a few judges uh, who are uh, taking uh, specific uh, care to ensure proper condition for the, the people with psychosocial disabilities. And this show how it is possible, uh, how the communication can be successful. And then the core decision is completely different. Um, so I want to share uh, a lot of other stories uh, with you, but uh, I realize I have to finish. Uh, I'm sorry, I have uh, so short time. Um, my point here is that um, justice system can be part of the problem and also can be part of the solution. And uh, as a lawyer, uh, I uh, constantly um, try to um, do what is possible, including to educate the, the lawyers and uh, judges uh, during the cases and uh, writing articles and uh, in every possible way. Uh, 
to educate uh, judges uh, and the court system that people with disabilities uh, may be persons with, uh, who went to trauma and we have to consider this and to make efforts to ensure them um, um, conditions for recovery. And again, the justice system can be part of uh, this recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aneta. I think you've also given us a lot of food for thought, not just about the problems faced, but the opportunities to uh, respond and improve the situation. I think starting with, with, with what you said at the beginning, that our justice systems can harm or heal. Um, what we are increasingly talking about and pushing for is the notion of safe justice. Um, we have long heard about efficiency of justice. We've long heard about success criteria based on prosecutions and based on avoiding uh, prosecuting or, or convicting innocent people, which are all extremely important points, but we have to include the safety of victims and their experience within the justice system. And as you've pointed out, the judge, court staff and others uh, have the power over people's lives and they may even have the tools to make a difference, but they don't necessarily use those tools unless they have empathy, unless they understand the impact of the crime, unless they know the needs of victims. Uh, and I think you've shown that, that it's not just about judges, but it's about um, court advocates, it's about lawyers, uh, and it's about uh, victim support organizations coming together to protect victims. Uh, so there are many connections from previous speakers. We think about, I think about the uh, Suzanne's uh, presentation, ensuring that universities are training uh, the future judges of the world and about the long-term training as well. So a lot of things to unpick there. Uh, I really hope you'll stay with us and you'll join us in the BSE hub and we can continue to hear about those stories and have those conversations as well. So I will now move on to our next speaker and we move from the justice sector to the health sector. Um, we, we are seeing increasingly around the world that, that uh, there are more and more specialised ways that the health sector can be supportive of victims. And we're going to hear now from Marta Chavez, who is the Assistant Coordinator of the National Programme for the Prevention of Violence in the Life Cycle at the Directorate General of Health uh, in Portugal. And Marta has been actively advocating for the rights and protection of children and youth, including promoting the prevention and intervention in violence throughout the life cycle. And in 2012, Martha, Marta became the representative of the Ministry of Health in Portugal, presenting the national plans for the prevention and combat of trafficking in human beings. So today, Marta will tell us about victim, the, the victim support mechanism they've implemented in the healthcare system in Portugal. Thank you, Marta, the floor is yours. Um, good morning, first of all, uh, I would like to thank um, personally and in, on behalf of the Directorate General of Health uh, the invitation to participate in this event uh, and, and greet all participants and the organizing committee. Uh, I, will, I will try to share my screen. Okay, so uh, the challenge that was launched to us was to present a model of response to victims in the health context uh, as established in Portugal, uh, namely the national program for the prevention of violence in the life cycle that I'm presenting today. Um, the literature reports that uh, health professionals are often uh, the first contact for, vi for victims and are considered as a source of support and trust. Uh, hence the importance of organizing a structured, uh, uniform and efficient response in the health sector. Um, so uh, first of all, in the health sector, uh, we had a recognition that um, violence, in addition to being a uh, human rights and a public health issue, uh, is also a complex health problem, uh, a multifaceted clinical entity that requires a structure and organized approach. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, but it requires also an integrated approach with all the, the partners from the other sectors. Um, so, violence has the core characteristics uh, of a public health issue um, as magnitude, transcendence and vulnerability, uh, which implies also that it has a great potential for prevention. Uh, so, it is in this perspective that our program is formulated uh, with a great focus on the prevention of violence without forgetting the reparative intervention uh, in those situations that unfortunately uh, violence occurs. Uh, so, uh, the creation and adequacy of an intervention model in a public policy and also in the health sector um, involves several premises, being perhaps one of the most important, uh, it's uh, sustainability. Uh, in addition, there are other such, uh, in, we have to think in an approach that is preventive and systemic, equitative and participate. So are uh, other uh, challenges that stand out, but uh, for sure sustainability is the, one of the most important challenges and characteristics that we have to, to ensure. So our main focus is in prevention, the violence, uh, because it's also related to the high costs that violence entails and transcend uh, the direct costs of the health sector, namely uh, the loss of productivity, uh, the loss of quality of life, uh, and even the transgenerational impact, uh, which is one of the most worrying issues we feel while working with children and families. We really need to work to protect children and to break this cycle of violence and this transmission of a relational pattern uh, through uh, family relationships. So um, having these uh, issues in mind, uh, we started in 2008 uh, organizing um, um, our response in the health context. So in 2008, uh, it was created the Health Action for Child and Youth at Risk, uh, which was aimed at children uh, and young people under 18 years of age who are at risk of abuse or uh, suffered already uh, an abuse situation. So, but the, this recognition of the need to broaden the spectrum of the intervention led to the creation in 2013 of the Health Action on Gender Violence and Life Cycle. Uh, and it was aimed uh, at interpersonal violence uh, in adults. But in 2019, uh, uh, the National Program for the Prevention of Violence in the Life Cycle was created and both health actions were integrated in it. Uh, as well, it was created a, um, a specific area uh, uh, that includes the action plan for the prevention of violence in the health sector. And this plan is aimed uh, at the prevention of violence against health professionals uh, and others in the context of health service. Uh, so um, let me share a few words about our main vision and our mission in the program. Uh, that um, our vision is the promotion of a paradigm of good practices in the health sector, and um, it's developed under um, specific objectives, but around um, four main axes, which are literacy. So uh, we want to promote awareness campaigns uh, on human rights, equality, and especially a culture of non-violence which contribute to change in society's behavior and a progressive, a progressive social intolerance to violence. Yeah. Uh, in the good practices, we produce a lot of uh, technical guidelines for intervention, uh, training health professionals, uh, improve, improving the quality of the continued healthcare delivery uh, with regard to screening and early detection of violence, especially with particularly vulnerable uh, victims, 
um, but also we focused on diagnosis and intervention, um, assessing risk indicators of violence and fostering safety strategies. Uh, yeah, and all of these, uh, in order to avoid uh, escalating danger and at the limit, uh, death of victims. Um, and also we address to a fundamental support for the perpetrators of violent conducts in a systemic approach. Uh, another exit is the epidemiological surveillance uh, that we, uh, we want to improve the knowledge and investigation of this phenomenon uh, of, uh, in, inside the health ser services. And uh, we also have uh, another exit uh, which is intra and intersectoral articulation uh, and contrib uh, this contributes to an appropriate, timely and articulated protective intervention uh, through integrating uh, all the proximity responses, including the reporting of crime to, uh, to the judicial entities, uh, all these based in a salutogenic model and uh, on promoting health and good health um, in all its um, faces and dimensions. Uh, so, um, as I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you, um, like our um, the access and the mission of the program. So we, we um, try to reinforce the network intervention, like I said, uh, uh, in, um, improve a salutogenic model, um, prevention of interpersonal violence as a goal. So uh, this is our compl uh, complete overall mission. Um, and regarding to the areas that uh, we address, uh, our approach to violence includes several areas, as, uh, like um, the violence against children and young people, uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence, violence against the elderly, uh, um, sexual violence, trafficking in human beings also, among others. Uh, so, and as I mentioned above, uh, we have this specific action plan inside the program that is addressed uh, to the violence within the health services. Um, and this area was highlighted inside the program uh, because it's also necessary to us to reflect on the violence that occurs inside the health service uh, in a perspective uh, that is uh, preventive. But also we need to ensure that if there is an occurrence, we have an effective, adjusted and appropriate response to the needs of those who are victim, victims. And the premise here is that safe and health work environments prevent the situations of violence and increase workers' satisfaction. So uh, at the end, we, we achieve the result of a higher quality of services. Um, the general framework, our, our program, is sustained uh, in a network of multidisciplinary teams um, constituted in the National Health Service. Um, we have the support teams for children and youth at risk and the teams for the prevention of violence in adults. Uh, the first ones have intervention until 18 years old, and uh, the teams for prevention of violence in adults addresses to people uh, above 18 years old. So these teams include doctors, medical doctors, nurses, psychologists, and social workers, and some have um, uh, lawyers or uh, and, uh, and uh, child educators also, but mostly are these four um, professional categories. So uh, doctors, nurses, psychologists, and social workers. Uh, they have these, uh, their roles are addressed here in these budgets. Um, and I can tell you that we now uh, have uh, 531 teams uh, across the country. Uh, they are in both 
levels of care, so primary care and hospital care level. Um, but it's important also to, to note that these professionals are not involved in full-time teams. Uh, they are available. Uh, availability is uh, variable. Uh, some people have more hours, people have less hours, so they are not full-time and it would be excellent, but it's not possible by the moment. And some uh, professionals are even shared between teams. So uh, someone who works in the teams for children also uh, probably will also integrate the teams for adult uh, people. And uh, we have uh, now to, um, a slide to show you our model or our governance model. So uh, very simple. Uh, we have national coordination in the Director General of Health. Then we have um, in, in all the regions, in five regions in Portugal, the regional coordinators and in, um, in, in the islands of Azores also. And so at the local level, at um, primary care and hospital level, we have this network of multidisciplinary teams, as I told you. Um, regarding to our uh, approach, so uh, what we try to promote is humanization, proximity and continuity of care. A victim that is flagged in a hospital, for example, should have the opportunity to be accompanied and followed in her area, in her place of residence by her family doctor, family team that knows her or him, uh, and if necessary, with the resources of the community uh, to which one belongs. So uh, we want to, to improve this proximity and continuity of care. And as example of the resources in our communities, we can mention the national system uh, for the promotion of rights and protection of children, the national support network for victims uh, of domestic violence, and the support and protection network for victims uh, of trafficking in human beings. And here, um, today, I would like to have a special word for the articulation that we have with the support, um, su uh, victim support structures, since we are in this event, it's important to mention also, uh, because we would like to highlight the role that they have had all this time as partners uh, of excellence in the health sector, in the evaluation, uh, protection and monitoring of uh, victimization. Um, in a perspective that uh, will prevent the revitimization, like we heard before in other, with other speakers, and promote the empowerment of victims and also monetize resources. Um, and also, I would like to, to share with you here, um, like I said, one of our um, guidelines, our technical guidelines. Um, one of, uh, we have several guidelines uh, addressed to, to our model, but here uh, we'd like to show one of them and then share uh, with you our prevention model that is really very simple. So, Marta, we are, excuse me, excuse me, you have five minutes left. Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, our model, our primary prevention is very simple. We have a primary prevention and we are addressing and based on activities aimed at promoting healthy relationships, respect, negotiation, uh, trust, honesty, uh, appropriate communication. And then in second, uh, pre secondary prevention, we have a general flowchart of action that is composed of six main stages, as you can see in the right uh, side, um, and where a systematic screening of situations of violence is promoted, as well uh, the evaluation of situations. So here we have the, the stages and um, our focus, um, intense focus on screening, early screening. But then also we have the third, uh, third year prevention, uh, where after evaluation, uh, a diagnostic hypothesis is placed and the intervention is appropriate to the diagnosis made and the degree of risk or danger that was detected. 
So the central idea is to ensure that we have uh, an adequate, timely and articulate intervention with all the support resources that we need in the, for that uh, specific situation. Uh, so uh, we can have this diagnosis hypothesis, there uh, is no risk, we have suspicion but no imminent danger, we have confirmation but with uh, imminent danger or a situation of confirmation and imminent danger. And for each one of these, we have a specific protocol of action. Um, and um, our model um, and all the program um, are sustained in an extensive legal framework within the health sector and in general lot of the country. So we have um, technical frameworks, intervention guidelines that were supported, uh, were produced to support and guide the intervention of health professionals. Uh, the professionals who are part of these multidisciplinary teams receive initial training in the model and then continuous and specific training is ensured and also these teams uh, develop training and awareness raising actions with other health professionals involved in the direct provision of care. So we try to spread this training and this awareness throughout all the health professionals in through all the national health system. Uh, and finally, um, as a result of a major um, document demat dematerialization effort, uh, I would like to point that our risk assessment tools in children and young people have been available in our clinical digital health platforms since uh, 2013. And the clinical registration form for adult violence is available since uh, last year, uh, 2020. Uh, so they facilitate uh, the registration, surveillance and signaling for multidisciplinary teams at both levels of care. We, we are trying to improve communication uh, via our uh, support system uh, between two levels of care. And just to finish, our main motto will always be to intervene early, uh, screen of uh, risk factors, so we intervene early to intervene at risk, avoiding evolving to danger. Um, and then I just uh, would like to thank you once again for this opportunity to participate in this event and to present the work that we are trying to, to improve and to establish in the National Health Ser uh, Service in Portugal. Uh, and I am available for any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Right, so thank you so much. That was an extremely comprehensive presentation. It's given us... Uh, uh, serious considerations of thought. Um, lots of things to, to unpack there as well. I think that, that the fact that you have uh, a, a high level strategic approach to this, it's, it's national, it's comprehensive. Um, you look at prevention, identification of victims and supporting them to reach the, the, the help that they need um, and, and it, it is part of a holistic approach, I would say, uh, which is what we need both in victim support in the health sector, in the justice sector. It's understanding that there's a victim's journey. And if we don't identify victims, uh, they'll never reach the support. But if you don't have uh, professionals who are trained and have the tools, the digitalization tools to help them, then, then we won't see the progress and the actual implementation of the laws as well. So there's a lot talk being spoken about on, on digitalization of justice, but uh, it's just as important within the healthcare sector and it's important to connect where appropriate as well. So thank you so much for that, for that presentation. Uh, we're moving into our, our last session now. Um, I have the absolute pleasure of, of welcoming Professor Dr. Michael Duffy, who will be talking to us about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and its use within in, in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. So Dr. Michael Duffy is a, a cognitive psychotherapist who's specialized in PTSD and complex grief. Is the director of the specialist MSc Trauma in Cognitive Behavioural Therapy over at Queen's University uh, in Northern Ireland and is uh, recognised as a worldwide expert on psychological impacts of trauma. Since his work with the trauma team after the Omaha 
bombing in 1998. He's provided workshops on PTSD for therapists working with large scale traumas, including the 9 11 uh, attacks and the Utoya uh, Island shootings. Dr. Michael Duffy is further also a member of the recently formed UK Trauma Council. Professor Duffy, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak at the conference. <clears throat> I look forward to the day when we can actually do this in a uh, uh, face-to-face situation and um, get to know you all a little better. Um, so um, I want to talk today um, about um, our work in treating uh, trauma-related conditions such as uh, PTSD. And I just want to check, uh, can you see my slides now? No, not uh, Can you see them now? No? No. Okay, so let me just try this again. Uh, boom, 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 boom. All right, okay. It's not. So, Marina, do you want to talk it through? Yes, I can just share the PowerPoint now. It's open on my computer. Uh, I think I've, yours is not the one that I have, though. Um, let me, uh, <laughs> I just added a couple of slides last night, so let me just... Okay. So hopefully you can see it now, can you? Yes. Uh, okay, that's great. Um, do I need to go into the full screen, or can you read it as it is? It would be great if you could go into full screen if you do this um, slideshow. That would be better. All right. Up at the top. Why is that? Is that okay? If you go up to the top, there's a screen... Um, at, at the very top, if you uh, click on that. On the left it's side. Like a, on the left, top left, up a bit, up, up, right up. There you get that one. Okay. So, how's that? Perfect. Very good. Very good. So, um, it's 11.44 my time. Uh, uh, you'll keep me right uh, in the time, I, I assume. So I, I want to talk today about um, our experience in treating uh, post-traumatic stress disorder linked to violence in Northern Ireland, um, and, but also draw on uh, international um, studies and what the current uh, thinking is in the, in the field of um, psychological care. Um, because I think, as I mentioned in the uh, discussion earlier, some of this will fit uh, nicely with the work that you're trying to do with victims of violence in that immediate aftermath uh, of violent experiences. Uh, so I need to just talk a little bit about what cognitive therapy is first, so that makes sense to you probably then what we're trying to do. And um, the basic cognitive principle that uh, underpins our models uh, is that people are upset, not by events or situations per se, but the, the personal meanings that these have for them. So. Several people can be caught up in the same incident, the same uh, violent attack. Four of them uh, may recover well, but three of them will go on to develop a chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's largely because in the immediate aftermath, they have developed additional meanings in relation to the trauma, about what it means about themselves, about the world around them, and about the future. So we have to try and discover those meanings in order to help. And essentially, this is how it works. There's an event. If I interpret that event in a negative way, then I'm likely to have a negative emotional response to that event. And a lot of this is largely due to these thinking errors that human beings um, have the capacity to develop. So uh, uh, we, have, we have a capacity to uh, go quickly to all or nothing thinking. So if I suffered one violent attack, that means the rest of my life now, I've got to be hyper vigilant because there's definitely going to be another one. So we get into all or nothing thinking. We also have the capacity to abstract from our memory only material that fits with our current emotional state. So if I'm currently hyper vigilant and the lookout for an attack, I will only select when I try to think about the past violent incidents that confirm that life is dangerous. So this is a powerful one as well as PTSD. We catastrophize. The world's a dangerous place now. It's gonna be like this for the rest of my life. I have to be hyper alert. And we overgeneralize. 
so I have had one bad experience. That means, uh, and I was attacked by a man. All men are now dangerous. I've got to be on the lookout for them all. They're all males. If a man walks into the room, I've got to leave. Um, and so these sorts of thinking styles, jumping to conclusions, and trying to mind read as well. So looking at a person, uh, if, uh, one of my patients who was uh, sexually assaulted, she's now frightened of all men. But if, a, if, if she's out socially and, and a man walks into a room, she tries to read his mind on the basis of how he's behaving and uh, uh, and tried to work out what he's thinking. And of course, most always gets it wrong and sees it as a threatening uh, situation and, and leaves. So these thinking errors, we have to try to discover as part of good cognitive therapy and good CBT. Because this is essentially how it works. Um, if we have a, a, a situation, then uh, people suffer a negative experience. They start to think about it in a certain way and that generates uh, uh, powerful emotions. Those emotions such as anxiety, for example, uh, they will be felt in a very physical way as we talked about earlier. And then people will do things in response to these thoughts and, uh, and feelings and sensations to try and suppress them, for example. Uh, but uh, that may have a short-term effect but it leads to more negative thoughts. So if, for example, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a danger outside my home after I was assaulted, I feel really, really anxious about that. When I feel anxious, I'll have butterflies in my stomachs. So, you know, I, I, I feel sweating in my hands. I will have palpitations in my chest. And as a result of that, I will decide to stay indoors and not go out. But that has a short-term effect. It reduces the anxiety, of course, and I feel a little, I feel a little bit better. But I learned from that uh, uh, false information that the, the way for me to stay safe now is to remain indoors hereafter. And so I developed new negative thoughts that uh, the only way I can cope with life now is to stay indoors. And so I have circles going round and round that maintain my post-traumatic stress disorder. So what is CBT? Well, uh, there are some uh, myths about CBT, uh, and we have to recognize the facts about CBT. It has a normalizing emphasis. And so, you know, the patients come into my clinic uh, with PTSD, they're hypervigilant, they're extremely scared after an assault. We, we will start off by normalizing those sensations and those emotions. If I was assaulted, I would feel like that. I would feel anxious and afraid. And uh, that helps form a therapeutic relationship. Uh, but unlike other therapies, we don't spend a lot of time working on the emotion. The emotion for us is a window into the mind to look for the key, the key beliefs that are driving that emotion. Uh, so if I have intense fear, then I want to know what are the thoughts that are driving that intense fear. Uh, we will empathize with the emotion, but we really want to discover the beliefs that are driving it because just talking about the emotion is not going to change it. It's modifying the beliefs that are driving the emotion is imp very important. We work in a very structured way and a problem oriented way. And that means we get through a lot in the sessions. So we, there's not a lot of drift uh, and each session is connected to the next one, which means that there's progress uh, is monitored week upon week upon week. And hence uh, CBT works well in a relatively short number of sessions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, from the very outset, we uh, emphasize the importance that it's a working alliance, that we're not the expert trying to fix the client. We both work together to discover solutions to your problems. And so we really need you to engage with me uh, early on in, uh, from session one. And we explain how that works. And part of that is that we will set tasks for you to try and do between the sessions, we call them homework tasks. Uh, and these are usually experiments to test out if we try and do things differently, does it have an effect on your mood and your anxiety? So homework's an essential part of what we do. We use cognitive and behavioral strategies together. I'll explain those in a moment. And we uh, have a lot of emphasis on outcome measures from session to session. We wanna see, are we making progress or are we not? If we're not making progress after three or four sessions, we need to know what's going on here so we can make changes in the sessions. Perhaps we're targeting the wrong area and so on. And by using weekly outcome measures, it really enhances uh, our understanding or the client's understanding 
therapist's understanding of what's working and what's not working so we can make changes accordingly. And of course, the, the, the power of outcome measures is that it gives us a good pre-treatment and post-treatment measure to help us understand if the model is actually working for this group of patients and clients. It helps us understand if there are deficits, what perhaps was the reason, and then we target those areas for the next study to see if we can improve the outcomes for that group and so on. It's really about insight and change. I think some therapies, and uh, in the past I worked more psychodynamically, uh, and a lot of the emphasis was on uh, insight. Insight was a really important part of what we do. But within CBT, there's a, 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 there's a dual pro, uh, process that's constantly unfolding within each session, insight and change, insight and change. And from week to week, we want to understand if the insight is leading to change, and if it isn't leading to change, then we need to try and look at, are we working in the wrong areas? Do we need to try and look at other beliefs and so on? So that's just a very quick summary of uh, what we would take two years to train our students in, in relation to CBT. Uh, but it's just a rapid run through to give you a sense of what it is all about. So we work very collaboratively. The focus is on the here and now. Now, you may say, wow, how does that work if you're working with post-traumatic stress disorder? Because it's about an event that happened in the past. Yes, it's true. But our interest is what impact is that event in the past having on your life in the here and now? How is it restricting you? Uh, what way has your life changed since the trauma? We can't change what has happened in the past. So there's not much point in uh, spending time in the past not spend a lot of time in childhood experiences, for example, the purpose of revisiting the past is to discover how has that affected how you think and behave in the present. And so we will revisit the past, for example, in PTSD, we will relive the trauma, but the purpose of doing that is to try to discover how that's impacted on your memory and on your belief systems, what you make of the world today, what you make of yourself today, in terms of how you think the trauma has changed you as a person. Uh, and so we uh, try to modify those uh, maintenance factors that are keeping the trauma memory alive. So the focus is on the present, revisiting the past in order to free you up from the past experiences and allow you to reconnect with the world in the present. And a huge part of that and what we do is about education. Education, education, education. This is not a talking therapy. This is an education therapy. And so we're sharing knowledge from session to session and we're seeking information from the client from session to session about their world, about how the trauma is impacted in their world, on their thinking styles and so on. And through this evolving process of increasing understanding and knowledge from session to session, we build up a very strong relapse prevention mechanism. It's one of the reasons why a CBT has a very high recovery and a very low rate of relapse compared to other therapies. And so it's quite structured uh, and it's time limited and it's driven by a formulation around a model for that particular condition. And I'll show you one or two of those shortly. So how are we doing with cognitive therapy at the moment? Well, this is just two slides to show uh, in our trials and our colleagues in Oxford uh, and in the studies with our colleagues in the UK, this is how we're doing at the moment in relation to each of the main, these main conditions, uh, the main anxiety disorders. We're doing very well with panic disorder. These are the percentage of clinically improved. General anxiety disorder, we're not doing as well, but we've got a way to go. Social anxiety disorder now is about 80% recovery. Obsessional compulsive disorder, doing well. Health anxiety, uh, needs a bit more work. Specific phobias really well, and PTSD is now one of the most effective models that we have. And what's fascinating is the number of sessions we need. So this is not two years sort of you know therapy, um, uh, trying to explore all sorts of historical uh, and past events. Because we're focused on what we're looking for, and we uh, work in the manner in which we do, What's really fascinating is that we can help people, uh, you know, move on and recover in very few sessions. Panic disorder now is about four to five sessions. Excellent model we have. 
uh, social anxiety, doing really well, and a PTSD. On average now, this, that was about 20, but that's across the three main CBT models. When we look at the model I'm going to present briefly today, which is the cognitive model, we're actually now moving people on within about 12 to 13 sessions. So it's very encouraging that we don't need to commit people for you know months and years to therapy any longer. We can make rapid gains uh, and people do, do quite well in short periods of time. Okay, so today I want to look at uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, because it's still the most common condition that links to, to uh, traumatic incidents such as assault, uh, uh, attack and so on. And there are two main diagnostic manuals, as we know. There's the American DSM-5 model and there's the European ICD-11 model. And this is interesting because the, the two manuals now have slightly different definitions of PTSD. Uh, DSM-5 criteria is here. Uh, it's, first of all, you have to be exposed to a, a, a threatening situation. Um, uh, you then experience intrusions in the form of maybe flashbacks or nightmares of that event. People then engage in all sorts of ways to avoid either the scene of the trauma or avoid thinking about the trauma. Uh, it leads to then these changes in their uh, mood state and their thinking. Uh, and interestingly, item D is not part of the ICD-11. Um, then there are these major alterations in arousal and re-experiencing the trauma. So people get really hyper aroused uh, and hyper vigilant on the lookout for danger and threat. Uh, and the, 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 the symptoms last for at least a month and they do significant distress or impairment in functioning. What's interesting about the European manual is that it has created a new criteria called complex PTSD down here. And so now uh, PTSD in the European manual is really just the three core clusters of post-traumatic stress. So re-experiencing the trauma in the form of intrusions, avoidance of reminders, and this a sense of current threat uh, as if the trauma is happening again. Uh, so these remaining hyper-aroused and hyper-vigilant uh, for this sense of threat. And ICD-11 has now defined this new condition of complex PTSD, which has those core uh, uh, PTSD elements, but it adds to it uh, these additional elements. So emotion regulation difficulties, a very profound negative view of the self, and uh, a, 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 a real damaged capacity to, to uh, have healthy uh, interpersonal relationships. ICD-11's group uh, uh, rationale for doing this is that the, the hypothesis is that this more complex form of PTSD is related to uh, childhood traumas uh, uh, and specific types of uh, traumas such as prolonged imprisonment and torture uh, 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 that, see, that they argue differentiates those traumas from the remainder of the other types of traumatic incidents such as assault um, uh, and so on. So it remains to be seen uh, in the next few years uh, uh, how valid these two categories are or how distinct they are. And there's lots of research going on now to try to, to learn from these, uh, these new conditions. Uh, in fact, we're just about to launch a, a major trial here in January, uh, looking at the treatment of complex PTSD across five sites in Northern Ireland and seven in England. So that's a, an interesting new uh, uh, research study for us. So how common is this? Well, um, in PTSD, uh, on, over a, there's about a lifetime prevalence of 7.8%. But the studies tell us that there are some distinctions um, and uh, that the risks vary according to a number of factors. So, for example, it is still uh, argued that uh, there's a higher risk amongst women, uh, significantly higher, of developing PTSD than men after traumatic incidents. Um, but what's fascinating uh, about this is that there is a natural recovery after a traumatic event. This is a massive constellation of all sorts of research. Um, uh, and, and the pattern shows us what the recovery is after a traumatic incident for people who haven't got therapy at all. So here we have 100% uh, of people who develop acute stress disorder. 
and PTSD, acute PTSD. This is the, the natural recovery over months. So by about 18 months, <clears throat> about 40 to 50% of people who have initially PTSD, they'll recover without any need for help. But what's important is that after about 18 months, we see that there will be a proportion, whoops, <clears throat> there will be a proportion, who, if they have PTSD here, between 18 months and two years, they're gonna retain it for the rest of their lives. So the good news is about 60% of people will recover. The bad news is up to 40% of people who have PTSD will not recover without treatment. And the secret, and this is part of what we can talk about with uh, the immediate aftermath, is how we spot this group, how we differentiate this group. Uh, we leave this group alone. These people are going to do okay. But how we screen and spot the people who are likely to need ongoing help. And this is what we're trying to discover in recent years. Uh, wh who are the people who are most likely to be vulnerable to developing chronic PTSD? Okay, so we know the types of trauma uh, uh, relate to different rates of PTSD. How are we doing for time, guys? Um, <clears throat> you are half, uh, half time. Half time, that's always do we have half time break. No, <laughs> that's okay. So what we know is that different traumas are associated with different rates. Uh, so interpersonal traumas are still producing the higher rates of PTSD. So uh, for example, rape, uh, we have got very high rates of PTSD uh, with about 65% of men and 46% uh, of women who are rape meet PTSD criteria. This is an interesting one because it, 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 it's very, it, with the uh, overall finding that women are more vulnerable and have higher rates of PTSD overall. Yet in these studies, we find that men who are, who are sexually abused, there are higher rates of PTSD. But overall events such as war combat, child abuse and attack, kidnapping, produce much higher rates of PTSD than natural disasters. So for example, if there's an earthquake, if there's a, a a flooding, you will get lower rates of PTSD than people who've been assaulted, sexually abused, kidnapped, and so on. Um, and so that's one factor that we should be looking out for in trying to work out who are likely to be more vulnerable. Some staff groups, because of their constant exposure to trauma, are more vulnerable. So emergency workers, NA workers, army personnel. I'm not sure if we've done any work with victim support staff to find out what's the rates of PTSD here with people who are constantly working and helping people who have been perhaps traumatized. It might be an interesting study for us to think about. Are people working here in victim support more vulnerable as a result of what they do? So the evidence is pretty clear that uh, trauma-focused CBT and EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, are advocated as the two leading evidence-based uh, treatments for PTSD at the moment. We have a lot of randomized controlled trials now that demonstrate these effects. Um, and I haven't time to go into a lot of detail, uh, but just to say that uh, the evidence base for trauma-focused CBT is pretty strong. Uh, EMDR is still recommended as a treatment of choice, but uh, the, the studies uh, aren't as uh, strongly designed and the follow-up data isn't as strong as for trauma-focused CBT. So there are some differences, but both of them have sufficient evidence to be recommended by NICE as the first-line treatments for PTSD. Now, why is evidence important? I mean, why are we talking about evidence? Why am I talking about outcome studies? Well, it's because if we don't have evidence, we can offer anything and anything on the basis of what we think might be useful. But we now know that isn't a sensible thing to do. And a lot of the studies around this came from debriefing. Now, let me check. Can you see the top of my slides, guys? Because I can't on my screen. Yes, I can see. Okay. So why is evidence so important? Well, we used to offer something called critical incident stress debriefing after traumas. And it was believed that, you know, uh, debriefing was the right thing to do. So we get people together after a traumatic event uh, and we would involve them in groups and ask them to talk about how they were coping with the trauma and how it was impacting on. But it was only when we started gathering data around debriefing did we realize that something wasn't right. 
So there have been a number of studies now in debriefing. I'm just going to show you this one by Richard Mayhew and his colleagues. And so here we've got the uh, trauma scale on the left-hand side. And the, along the bottom, we've got um, a measure of uh, the, the baseline measure, what the, the rate of trauma is at four months and three years later. So we're going to look at the group that got debriefing and the control group who got nothing at all. And what you find happens is with the group who got debriefing, they had high rates of PTSD. After four months, they came down. And after three years, they come down. So on face value, that looks okay. You say, well, that's good. This intervention was helping. This is why it's important that we design research really well. Proper designed controlled studies are essential in our field. Because when you look at the group who got nothing, this is what you find. First of all, the rates of PTSD dropped much, much lower in the group. And they remain much better three years later. So something about the intervention was getting in the way of people's natural recovery. We actually were causing harm. And this has put a big spanner in the works about what we do in the immediate aftermath. So now NICE guidelines makes it very clear and recommends that people should not receive critical incident stress debriefing after traumatic events. So what do we do then instead? Well, this is what we're trying to look for. This is why we've got to look at uh, 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 the importance of research. So in terms of PTSD, uh, John Bisson's done a really excellent media analysis of all the effects of all the therapies that are available. And he's updated that now in the last couple of years. But essentially, this is what the findings are. Um, trauma-focused CBT and EMDR work better than other, uh, uh, controls and wait lists and other therapies. Um, there were limitations about the EMDR trials, as I said, that uh, I haven't time to go into today. Um, but there's limited effectiveness for group CBT and stress management. And really, other therapies didn't show any clinically important effects. Um, there are some concerns also about the ability to tolerate these therapies with dropout rates of 30%, up to 40% in some of these studies. And that's not satisfactory. Um, uh, another more uh, recent study showed that a uh, media analysis looking at all the studies. More than half the people who completed therapy uh, with even uh, the, the evidence-based treatments, uh, they do well, uh, but there are questions about, you know, a lot of the studies are conducted in research centers and how well do they roll out into uh, the real world? I'll show you a couple of those in a moment. Um, and the majority of people across all these studies still retain some, some symptoms. They may not meet the criteria for PTSD, but they still have some symptoms. I mean, I have to try and work out how we improve things. Um, uh, and one interesting finding is that those with combat-related PTSD, they improve less well than any other forms of trauma. Okay, so what do we know about what indicates whether or not people are likely to develop PTSD? This is a big study by Chris Bruin that looked at all the factors that uh, relate to people who involved in a whole range of studies. These are all significant. So all of these factors are significant predictors of whether someone will go on to develop chronic PTSD. Uh, uh, they differ in terms of their coefficient size, so some are more significant than others. Uh, so for example, if you dissociate during the trauma, you're more likely to develop PTSD. If you uh, think that you've got, uh, if you're, if you've got low social support, you're more likely to develop PTSD and so on. So they're all significant, but some have stronger significance than others. Uh, and another really excellent one uh, conducted by Ozer in this group, uh, it categorized the predictors into what people were like, the key variables before a trauma and the key variables during the trauma. So if you had a family history of uh, mental Ill health, if you had a previous trauma and so on, then you were you know, at risk of developing PTSD. But the key and more important ones were what you did immediately during the trauma so if you dissociated during the trauma, if you had negative emotions during the trauma, et cetera, if you thought your life was at risk, then these were more significant predictors of you developing PTSD. So this is all useful. So we know that there are some pre-trauma factors that relate to people being vulnerable. We know that there are some factors during the trauma that relate to people being vulnerable. But more recently, we wanted to find out what happens in the immediate aftermath. And we have some studies now that tell us 
that the initial symptoms immediately after the trauma are indicators of those who are going to develop PTSD. And so going back to that graph I showed you earlier about the, you know, the 60% who recover and the 40 who don't recover, the 40 who don't recover are those probably who are going to have the more severe core symptoms of PTSD in the immediate aftermath. And so it's a key area for us to try and screen for and try to identify those who are more vulnerable. Um, so, and other studies that have looked at Richard Bryan's group at a cohort of people who are admitted uh, traumatic injury to major hospitals across Australia after road traffic accidents and so on. And what they found was that it wasn't just who had the uh, high rates of PTSD, the higher experiences, but the higher specific symptoms who were more at risk to go on to develop uh, severe PTSD. So those with the stronger intrusive memories, those with the stronger uh, hyper arousal symptoms uh, in the acute phase where they, they were the ones who were more likely to be at risk and they were the ones who we should be targeting for early interventions. So I think this is really important new uh, emerging data. Michael, uh, just to let you know, you have 10 minutes left. Okay. Thank you. So, our work in Northern Ireland has been looking at people who've been affected by conflict. And the conflict here has affected thousands of people, bombings and shootings. Uh, uh, so we have lots of research over 25 years now trying to explore how we treat PTSD more effectively. And a lot of work has been conducted after the Uma bombing, for example, in 1998. And what we found was when we did large studies of the populations, this is with the adult study, that these were the key factors that indicated whether they were likely to have PTSD. So again, the pre-trauma characteristics were female, previous problems, and so on. What they were exposed to during the trauma increased their likelihood of developing PTSD. But the higher variables, the ones that were higher predictors were what people did in the immediate aftermath. If they had negative views of themselves, if the memories had here and now qualities that were very strong, if they ruminated about the trauma and tried to suppress the thoughts, they were much higher risk of developing PTSD. We did a massive study in all the schools and found the same with children and young people. With young people, it was, it, not what they'd seen during the trauma and not what they brought to the trauma in terms of their age and gender, but if they developed negative beliefs about themselves or the symptoms, again, if they ruminated, thought about it over and over, and if the memory had a strong sense of as if it was happening over again, they were more likely to develop PTSD. And so these new findings we integrated into the treatment model for PTSD, and this is what we do. So the cognitive model essentially uh, uh, looks at trauma memory it looks at the negative meanings that the person has about the trauma. And then it looks at the strategies people are using to try to control the threat. And, you know, we, we do it in, the, in a modular form. I have to go through this quite quickly because of the time. But what we try to do is spot what the problems are in the trauma memory. And we will elaborate those. We will try and work out the negative meanings about the trauma, what it means, and we'll try and modify those. We will try and work out what strategies they're using are they using alcohol to suppress the symptoms and so on? Are they avoiding the scene? We'll encourage them to drop those and we will teach them to respond differently to triggers that induce these intrusions and flashbacks. And when we work on all these areas together over 12 weeks of therapy, people do really well. They also do well when we offer this as an early intervention. So this is the early intervention study that was offered in the immediate aftermath and it targets those early treatment uh, symptoms of PTSD compared to uh, 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 an information booklet, the wait list, the treatment did really well. We offered this to victims of the Oma bomb in 1998. And there were 91 patients who came into the study. Many had an allergic problem. And the good news is everyone did well, different rates of improvement, some only did 20% improvement. They had a lot of existing traumas prior to the Oma bomb, but most people improved 70% and above. And in our second study, and the good news is we did that over an average of about eight sessions, by the way. The second was a very chronic study of people from across Northern Ireland um, who had been exposed to many traumas on a PTSD over many years, uh, multiple traumas, diagnosed with more than one condition, as well as PTSD, had previous treatments that didn't work and so on. 
uh, and this was the type of traumas they were exposed to, bombing, shootings, and so on, road traffic accidents, assault, many of the types of traumas that victim support would work with, I would suggest. And again, we have the wait list here of those who were in the wait list. We didn't make progress, but after 12 weeks, those who got the therapy did really well, and that was maintained a year later. Everyone in the wait list entered therapy at this point and had the same results. So really positive, uh, encouraging results from that study as well. Okay, so what should we do in the immediate aftermath of trauma? Well, at the moment, the recommendations are that we should promote a sense of safety, encourage people to stay connected with society, to remain calm, and still hope that things can get better, that you know, this assault doesn't mean there's gonna be a repeated assaults and so on. And we also uh, have a strong consensus now that people need social support. So you can look at these, uh, the, uh, these sorts of general guidelines that are available yourselves, the TENSE guidelines for psychosocial care. It's really around the concept of psychological first aid. Um, so it's about mobilizing individual support, but also social support, uh, uh, combining them together. And I think this is the way that, that therapy and, and social support should go. Again, the Interagency Standing Committee advised that in this early phase, um, we need people to promote uh, sorts of therapies, uh, supports that have an Evans base that we can teach to workers who are not mental health professionals quite easily. So what should they be doing? Well, John Bisson's group said that we need to provide practical and pragmatic support as well as social support and psychoeducation based on the evidence. But once again, you can look at that review. It's all available online. Michael, you have three minutes left. I have to say that the three things I think we should look for are the following. Rumination, educate people about rumination, educate them about if, if they ask questions over and over, what if, why did this happen and so on, they're likely to develop PTSD. It's unhelpful. If they experience mental defeat, if they're throwing in the towel psychologically, uh, if they think this trauma means they're never gonna have a future, they're likely to develop PTSD. And if the trauma memory is richly experiencing the trauma as if it's happening over and over again, then we need to target those people for help as well. And I think that having time to go into site visits, but this is what we would typically do. We will bring people back to the site to update the trauma memory, to challenge any mis memory uh, distortions that they have about what actually happened. When I was assaulted, did I run the wrong direction? Let's go back and check out what else you could have done. Oh no, I was trapped. This was the only way I could have escaped. Those sorts of messages are important and powerful. Best found out by revisiting the site with the therapist or the support worker to accompany the person. I think that victim support can help uh, with all of these issues. We can help to normalize reactions. We can advise on the strategies that are helpful. We can educate about rumination, the importance of staying socially connected. And perhaps we can also accompany people on site visits, your staff could do this uh, to help people uh, uh, modify distortions in the memory. So we can work with the therapist perhaps in trying to achieve these things. So I had to race through that quite rapidly then for which I apologize. But I just want to say that this quote probably says it all. We have developed the capacity to create a world of our own making and our imagination. And very few of us actually live in the real world. We live in a world of our perceptions and these differ dramatically according to our experiences. We may perceive anger when there is none. We may experience trauma when there is none. And if the distortion is severe enough, we may think that we're living amongst enemies, even when we are surrounded by friends. Thank you for listening. And I hope you find that useful. Michael, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Uh, I think, uh, not only in a very short time you managed to explain what is CBT, but also explore how it works and how it can be used by others. Uh, for me, there, there is a great opportunity to um, start, to, I call it democratizing therapy, giving, making it more accessible and, and provided by a wider group of people. You talked about psychological first aid. I think there are, one of the things about CBT is that there are tools uh, it provides to practitioners which they can use with victims. Uh, and you gave a lot of examples there. I know that there's 
uh, questions about the kinds of um, the kinds of questions needs assessment that could be um, asked uh, by victim support workers. I, I think you addressed some of those with the various lists of sources. Um, what we will do, I think I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you out, outside of the conference and maybe we can um, get some links to some of those resources and, and pass them on. I know that, that this is just a starting of a conversation along with many of the others. You've connected to a lot of our earlier conversations around social support. How do we educate family, friends and, and others to be part of the solution as well? Um, so I'm really excited to see where we can take this in the future. So thank you for that. Um, I will now hand over to uh, our president, uh, Joao Lazaro, who's going to close the conference. Just a quick reminder that um, we sent to everyone the uh, links for the uh, side events, which start at three o'clock this afternoon. Um, so don't forget to download those who had an attachment. There's also the links. And I will now hand it over to our president, Joao Lazaro. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. Dear friends, honored guests, on behalf of the organizers of this conference, of Victim Support Europe team, it is indeed my pleasure to make a few closing remarks and express gratitude to all those who made this event a reality. This year, Victim Support Europe provided a unique opportunity for a wide group of speakers, from victims to policymakers, academics, and practitioners, to provide a comprehensive analysis of the importance of cooperation between the sectors to love and maintain a comprehensive victim support system. Especially today's discussion pointed to the role of all sectors of society must play in supporting victims of crime. All of these examples help to highlight how essential it is that we all work together locally, nationally, internationally, between agencies and between public and private stakeholders. No government, no policy force, no industry, no organization of victim support can tackle victim support on its own. This conference is a testament to that and has highlighted the importance of bringing together victim support organizations, law enforcement, industry, academia, and relevant stakeholders together to share their ideas and work together, not only to tackle the issue of continuing the, to develop victim support, but also to find better ways to help victims in a coordinated approach. We have heard of good practice and numerous solutions. Our job is to, con to continue to expand on this practice, to increase knowledge and extend it throughout our countries and professions. Victim Support Europe will be working specifically on this during this year. We will work to better clarify the laws, policies and practice we need to have in place. We will work to increase the awareness of the public, practitioners, governments and victims. We do look forward to continuing this work in, di in direct collaboration with you all. I would like to thank you all uh, once more for your active participation and for all the hard work that you do. Uh, daily for the victims of crime. And I hope it has been informative and inspirational and you will return home or you will stay home in, in, this, in this occasion probably for most of, uh, of you, motivated to continue your work to support victims of crime. I certainly will. I hope to see you all soon in present, in face-to-face, -face, for networking, for a drink, for to develop innovation, because let's, let's face Online, online events does not really promote networking or innovation. So we will certainly uh, meet and uh, 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 don't forget the side effects, the, the side events. <laughs> don't, don't forget the side events. Uh, we will meet uh, all there. They are very, very good and very uh, high quality side events and speakers. So it's not really an end here, it's just the end of the plenary session. So I hope to see you first on the side events. And uh, obrigado, thank you. Uh, see you all. Bye, Bye everyone. Back to you. I have just simply saying goodbye and we see you after lunch. Have a good lunch. <laughs>
Um, you're, you're on mute. I would just, um, we will be launching um, uh, our online hub in the coming weeks and months. Um, maybe I would, I'll do a follow-up email with you, but maybe you'd be interested in, in um, sort of uh, participating in some of our activities. I think there'll be a lot of interest in, yeah. in kind of your work and the things that you said and where we can go with this. So thank you for that. Yes, that's absolutely. I saw. I just absolutely. I just saw, saw a lot of questions in the chat afterwards. But uh, I, I think some of the slides maybe answered them about what to look out for. But no, absolutely. Very, 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 very happy to 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 uh, have a follow up conversation with you. Yeah, and I, I, I uh, in the, in the resources that you gave for things like um, uh, some of the, I suppose, what was it, psychological first aid points, etc. Yeah. They looked like they were academic articles, which often. Um, NGOs don't have access to, but if if there, you happen to have links which are public access, that would be wonderful if you could send those on, because I will pass that to all of our organizations and participants. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the sort of three slides near the end that produce those guidelines, uh, they're, all, they're all websites, so you can get those. But when you go through them, if there's any particular ones that you th that you think that you, you know, I, I'll, I'll dig them out for you. Okay. Send me your email. Right. The ones that you think that you that you wish some, as you know, some academic articles are they're not very digestible or readable. And um, I, I try to s synthesize key findings uh, in those slides because yeah. they're very off-putting for people often, you know. So so you know, but but please do pull out the ones. Yeah, I, I mean, we we saw the question. I think what people will be asking now is, oh, okay, so. What when we are with a victim after maybe a terrorist attack or after some traumatic incident? What what parts of this can we do use and, and in, in our engagement to either help them? You talked about sort of manage self management, but then also to decide. You know, is this is this the right moment to refer them to a therapist? Um, and even in our work as as victim support, Europe, next year we'll be publishing. Um, uh, guidance and materials on what to do in the event of a terrorist attack. Um, one of the things I think we can try to, to do is inform people of the points you've made. If you can try to manage the thoughts um, uh, and think and in a more positive way, that could have an influence on it. We interviewed, for example, a, a victim after the Boston Marathon bombing, and, and she really felt she should have done more. She ran, she ran home because she has children and she wanted to make sure she survived for them. But that really worked on her, um, on her, on her, and, and the impact it had. And she felt she should should have been that you know the hero and stayed and helped. So I think um, this is really important. Yeah, I, th I think that's the sort of thing. I think you could produce a nice little booklet or, or a little sort of advisory note for people about good advice to give to victims, uh, uh, what to do and what not to do. So, you know, you could, and a little just paragraph about rumination, what it is and why it's not helpful and what to do instead. Uh, a little paragraph about, you know, um, <clears throat> self-care, remaining connected, even though it's hard to do so, try, you know, remaining socially connected. Two things, one, there's less time to ruminate if you do that. And secondly, secondly, it helps challenge some of the negative beliefs you may have developed that the world is a threatening place. So if you keep connected with people and you discover there are still good people in the world, those behaviors help undermine the beliefs that are driving PTSD. And so there are simple little strategies, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and for example, if you're involved in ongoing legal proceedings, which is another one, uh, you know, that may pr provide lots of triggers to remind you of the trauma. So be aware of that and prepare for those court cases and so on. It may make you feel a little unsettled. That's okay. It's just a trigger going into the trauma memory. As long as you don't come back out of the courtroom and start ruminating and withdrawing from people again, you'll get over that little sort of, you know, blip. You could produce some very useful information like that that I think would help dramatically. Well, an hour in touch with you. You won't escape from us. I, I know Iris is, <laughs> is listening intently. She, she's running that project. So I, I think. Oh, I thought it was just you and I, and that I was going. I was just going to deny I ever said any of this. <laughs> There's no escape. <laughs> well, thank you so okay. much. I don't, I don't know if you will be able to join any of the side events, but you're very welcome to. If you I, want can't, to. I can't. Um, I'm working on a, a big thing here, but <laughs> victims, uh, victims' pension, learning. 
and I've got a meeting with the Department of Justice this afternoon and I have to try and get some stuff written up for it. So uh, I would love to, but it's, it, it's, this is all a deadline for this. This all has to be ready by the end of the month. <laughs> no problem at all. In any case, um, I, th I, I think the, the future for us in terms of these contacts is the VSC hub. Um, I know we'll be animating it and having lots of activities and discussions. Um, we're in touch with a whole range of different academics, and I think there's good connections with um, uh, virtual reality, virtual body works, uh, empathy training, all sorts of things. So um, not only will we want to hear from you, but I think it might could be interesting for your work as well. So we look forward to that in the future. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.